I want to thank everybody um, for attending, and and I um, especially want to thank um, Dr. Schulich, Dr. Page, um, Dr. Digger-Gory, Dr. Bradley, and the rest of the Cancer Center leadership for um, giving me the opportunity to kind of put this together and 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 get this started. I think um, it's um, those of you that that know there's there's uh, a program called the the Cork program, which is um, that Dr. Page has helped spearhead that's that's medical schools and colleges of veterinary medicine that are uh, together and they have consortiums and um, they have a grant program through uh, the V Foundation. Um, I was trying to kind of model this after that, where we're actually looking at interactions between uh, people um, here at the at CSU and, and people at CU. So it's a little bit uh, when we talk about RFAs and and the, the RFPs looking at at you know secondary grants to write. It's kind of modeled after um, that court grant, which is certainly um, those can be I think two years. So they they can be one of the multi year grants that people start thinking about looking at um, as we go forward. Um, I'm going to share my screen and for a few introductory comments. Um, so this is uh, the this, this CUCSU Companion Animal Symposium. And uh, I should have put RFP there because that's um, RFA, RFP. I use RFP in the, the other, um, uh, when, I, when I send it out, that's what it's named. And our, our goal here, um, and, and the way I kind of envisioned this when I thought about it was, uh, an educational session on on comparative oncology to spark a discussion about how this resource may fit and or dovetail with current research initiatives within other parts of the CU Cancer Center. So the thought was let's let's spend an afternoon kind of talking about what what goes on in in uh, companion animal uh, cancer research and companion animal cancer therapeutics and try to identify some provocative questions uh, across and within research programs. So the structure of the talks today is kind of, and you know, a, a one on, on kind of clinical trials that kind of developmental therapeutics, one on um, what we know about the molecular genetics about canine cancers, summary of that kind of uh, MCO, then um, uh, a discussion on immunotherapy, kind of more THI related and then uh, on kind of what's been done in kind of lifetime studies or what is being done in lifetime studies and in dogs uh, that has more of a CPC focus. So I tried to really um, put this within the the research programs and the programs of the of the CU Cancer Center. Um, you know, I'm, I'm hoping people can identify potential collaborations or contacts across campuses in this process today. And if you notice in the schedule, when I put up the end, there's 20 minute presentations and then 25 minutes of discussion. So I really would like to get discussion and questions and people to press forward with other questions they have that may come up from the, the presentations. And then, you know, to stimulate these research projects through the issuance of this RFP, um, which is focused on this CU CSU collaborative studies uh, utilizing a comparative approach. So that's really what we're trying to accomplish today. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar or not completely familiar with comparative oncology. Um, the definition is, is given here. This is by the comparative oncology program at the Center for Cancer Research at the NCI. This is right off their web page. Um, and it's the study of naturally developing cancers and animals as, as models for human disease. Um, and with the thought that these spontaneous cancers in dogs and cats are an kind of underused group of, of malignancies that can um, we can study and and, and help uh, kind of progress our understanding of, of cancer um, as it applies to, um, to humans. And so it, it's really just thinking about cancer as a continuum across um, species that we, we live with and that we, we treat a lot in, in veterinary medicine and, and how we can study those cancers and how they can kind of be used as a surrogate to, to press forward what we know and, and how we treat human cancers. So that's that's really the idea. Um, the RFP that um, was uh, uh, included with the invite um, is is shown here, and this is really um, the the gist of of what we're trying to accomplish is to get people collaborating. And and we have these um, due to the generosity of of Dr. Schulich and Dr. Dr. Page, um, 
we we plan on um, being able to to uh, award uh, some one year awards with a, about a fifty thousand dollar cap uh, to look at questions in 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 comparative oncology and and dual human companion animal studies um, with with the intent of using the results to support a subsequent multi year national grant application. So. Our, our goal here is for when people write these awards to be looking at this as preliminary data or to show an interaction to springboard to another award within the next within the next year. So when you read the RFP, you'll see that that we're requesting a page that actually, you know, has some perspective um, uh, specific aims for that that grant that you that, that you're looking forward to. So a little more focused approach, not just a kind of a meet and greet grant, but a meet and greet and, and let's let's try to push this forward. Let's try to, to answer some questions that we think can then propel us to do um, some research that'll be competitive with a with a multi-year grant, you know, ideally an R01, but you know, R21s and, and other grants in that ilk, but trying to get some um, not just one-offs of projects that have some legs and that we're trying to kind of push forward with this with this approach. Um, so uh, are there any questions uh, about that? Okay. Um, so really with, without further ado, um, we can, we can press forward with, um, the schedule today. And, and like I mentioned, our, uh, first talk is going to be kind of more in the DT realm about clinical trials and companion animals and, and how they can be used to advance drug development. And this is going to be given by, uh, Dr. Jenna Burton, who's a, a medical oncologist here at the Flint Animal Cancer Center. Uh, the next talk is going to be uh, kind of more MCO focused. Um, it's going to be an overview of the, what we know about the molecular genetics of, of canine tumors uh, to be given by uh, Dr. Don Duvall uh, here at the, the Flint Animal Cancer Center. Then more related to kind of tumor host interactions, we're going to talk about immunotherapy in canine patients um, and, and what's being done. Um, this is, um, some people probably know, there's an ongoing trial now that kind of sprang out of some work from uh, Drs. Dow and Drs. Regan here that's now being done at Children's with Losartan. And so um, this is something that's a little more advanced in terms of the interactions with, with people at um, CU potentially. Um, and uh, again, we'll have uh, you know some time to discuss other things we may want to go with this. Um, and then uh, this, with regards to kind of cancer prevention and control, um, we're going to have uh, Dr. Page talk to us about um, the, the Golden Retriever Lifetime Study. Uh, that's currently um, uh, being carried out, and um, you know what, you know what kind of information is going to be there, and how that could potentially be, you know, utilized to to look at some, you know, kind of cancer prevention and control, population-based um, type approaches. Again, we have you know basically roughly 20-minute presentations and then 25-minute uh, discussions to kind of identify what we see as provocative questions or to ask provocative questions of of people here. And so, um, I, you know, I, I really want this to be an interactive forum and, and hopefully, um, we can, we can accomplish that. So, um, any questions before I turn over the, um, floor to Dr. Burton? All right. Without further ado, Jenna, it's all yours. All righty, let me uh, share my screen here. Oops, what are we all seeing here? I don't want a whiteboard here. Hold on, do over. Okay. There you go. Sweet. All right, can everybody see and hear okay? Doesn't look too funky or anything like that? Looks good. Okay, thank you. Um, so thanks for the opportunity to chat today. Um, I was just realizing, so I am um, a previous Flint Animal Cancer Center member, and then I left for a period of time, and I've been back for about a year. And um, I was just realizing that I just, um, my membership to the Developmental Therapeutics Program was just approved last month. So um, I don't know if this is like a trial by fire for continuing my membership or that sort of thing. Um, we'll see how that goes. Um, or if they're like, oh gosh, we got fresh blood back in, um, we can tag her for this talk. So, um, so I'm gonna talk about what we do here um, 
at the cancer center. Unclear why I'm not advancing. Um, so those of you that um, work up here at CSU, you can take your first bathroom break or go get a snack. Um, uh, chat about some of the resources that we have that um, can help us with some of these high level comparative oncology studies and um, just go through some more recent examples um, of how um, dogs specifically have contributed um, in the drug development process. Talk a little bit some of the challenges and hurdles that we face and then open it up for discussion. All right, so um, so who are we? Um, we are a, a big group of um, clinicians and researchers, graduate students, post postdocs and staff. Um, and so there's kind of um, the research side of the FACC and then the clinical side. And um, I think what's really nice about this program is that we're all in very close proximity um, and have a lot of day-to-day -day overlap. So um, we have a number of cancer-related research programs going on here, and some of these are listed here. And you'll be hearing from a, um, Dr. Duval and Dr. Um, Dow about some of their research programs. Um, we have our integrated oncology service, um, which is, is still, I, there's a lot of other veterinary schools that are moving towards this model, but really um, CSU kind of led with the development of this, um, the integrated oncology service model. Um, thanks to this guy over here, Dr. Steve Withrow, um, who many of you know, and so we're really fortunate that we have medical, surgical, and radiation oncologists. Um, all combined in a, in a single service. So we really feel like that can afford our, our clients and our patients the best care possible um, and avoid treatment delays and that sort of thing. We're also very fortunate that we have a dedicated oncology clinical trial center. Um, and so this is kind of a, a robust setup for managing um, and conducting our clinical trials that are happening here. Um, and it is truly oncology specific. Um, there are other universities that have a, a general hospital wide clinical trial center, but um, here we're fortunate just to be able to focus solely on oncology. So just a little bit about our clinical services, what we see on a daily basis, what we do. Um, you know, we are a full service tertiary um, referral center. That being said, um, our, our clients don't need a, um, a veterinary referral to come see us. They can self-refer and walk in with lumps and bumps to be evaluated. So we are a really busy service. Um, so we have um, about 1,600 new cancer patients annually. And um, you know we have navigated um, the, the COVID experience and are really back up to our pre-pandemic levels um, of service and have been for, for a year now. Our patient load is, we see a lot more dogs than we do cats. Um, and I think that's just the nature of where we live in Colorado. Um, so in more urban areas, um, it, certainly that shifts and you start to see a lot more feline patients. Um, but as, um, as you'll notice in this talk, I'll often default to saying, talking about dogs as um, the, the species that we use um, the most in comparative oncology. Um, and that's a little bit of just the nature that we see. Um, so as far as the, the canine tumors that we see on a regular basis, um, we see a ton of osteosarcoma. Um, I think we had three on the schedule on Monday. Um, so we see a lot of osteosarcoma. We see um, a lot of dogs with lymphoma um, with B cell forms being more common um, than T cell forms, but certainly um, T cell lymphoma is making up about 25% per case, uh, of the cases that we see. Um, soft tissue sarcomas, we see a lot of uh, sarcomas on dogs and carcinomas, so whether that's head or neck, um, a lot of bladder tumors, um, lung tumors, mast cell tumors, which is a very common skin tumor in dogs. Um, we of often see that frequently. Um, doesn't have a, a great human correlate. Um, and then we also see a lot of melanoma, which in dogs most typically occurs in the oral cavity, um, which is a little bit different than the solar induced melanomas um, that occur in people. 
So our clinical team, um, we're really lucky that we have a, a big um, team to support this, this caseload. So uh, again, it's a mis mixture of surgical, medical, and radiation oncology specialists. We have our trial center, which we'll talk a little bit more in a second. Um, you know, we've got a, a great number of technicians, but it never feels like enough. And then um, we have three dedicated patient client coordinators to help us get, um, get these patients in through the door. And uh, this is an older picture of the team. I don't know that we've had a post-pandemic picture um, with this many people all snuggled up that closely um, recently. So just wanted to talk a little bit about the resources that we have here that could be of interest. So um, Dr. Weishar is, is a, um, a human being, but an expert excellent resource for our clinical trials program and um, helping guide uh, investigators with developing their clinical trials for um, companion animals. So um, she leads the program. Um, there is um, under her guidance is a dedicated clinical trials um, coordinator and two technicians. We also have every year we have a, um, an intern, a specialty intern that's already graduated from vet school, completed a rotating internship and spends an additional year um, on the clinical trials program. And then our medical oncology residents also rotate through the clinical trials service just to um, afford them um, a little bit more experience and knowledge in conducting clinical research. Um, so Dr. Weishauer and her team are really um, well experienced and um, have expertise in dealing with clinical trials that investigate pretty much anything that we want to look at. So certainly chemotherapy is probably the most common, but we have a number of radiation oncology trials going on, um, looking at targeted therapies. Um, certainly we do a lot less work looking at devices, um, but um, you know we've got a a number of surgical um, trials going on as well, and then um, complementary and alternative medicine um, trials um, come through on occasion as well. So, um, you know, one of the benefits of veterinary medicine is sometimes there's a little bit less red tape um, involved in the way we work on a daily basis and conducting clinical trials. But I think what's nice about this program and how veterinary medicine has really progressed over the past few decades is that there's been a lot more structure and organization and accountability um, at various sites conducting clinical trials. And so, um, you know, review of clinical trials protocol is really important before we get things rolling. Um, at CSU, we have um, an IACUC and a clinical review board um, that functions to review these protocols. So some protocols, depending on the funding agency and depending on um, the, the setup of the protocol, they may require both IACUC and um, CRB review um, for protocols that are um, a little bit more aligned closely with standard of care. Those may be IACUC exempted and just get the um, CRB review. The turnaround time is pretty, pretty good. So about um, six weeks to get full approval from the time it's submitted. Um, and then um, here we've implemented, implemented standard processes, um, having a standardized owner informed consent form that we all work off of. Um, you know, this is a tertiary referral center. So we have a full range of clinical services on site that support our needs um, from clinical pathology, um, histopathology, um, radiology, really everything that we need to care for our patients. The trials team has a lot of experience in conducting both single site studies and conducting and or leading multi-center trials. We are a member of the Comparative Oncology Trials Consortium, which is um, managed through the Comparative Oncology Program at the, um, at the uh, NCI. And this figure is a little bit older. It just kind of shows the sites um, that are involved in this uh, COTC. Basically, it's um, most, um, most big vet schools. Um, that's not correct. It's most vet schools. And they just, there's some criteria that you need to have as far as, you know, who you have 
um, to support the program and the resources that you have at your school. Um, most recently, the vet schools at Oregon and Louisiana have been added on as well because they've been able to expand their resources. So um, um, this honestly represents the majority of vet schools that <laughs> exist in the country. Um, I think one of the, the really um, great things that we see in veterinary clinical trials, and hopefully this will be highlighted in some of the studies that I talk about, is that we really have excellent owner compliance for the procedures that are involved in these trials. So um, collecting blood samples, biopsies, um, you know, client visits. And then we also have a high compliance with necropsy examination um, when, the pet, when the pet does pass away um, from its cancer. Um, you know, clinical trials is all about dotting I's and crossing T's, and this team is excellent at that. We have GCP capability, and then they've got a lot of experience with data management and REDCap. So just a little stats on um, what's keeping them busy every day. So um, generally, there's about 20 to 30 active clinical trials in a given year. And the sponsors are really varied. So, um, you know, industry sponsored, we've got some internal mechanisms, foundation grants, um, philanthropy, um, you know, some NIH grants. And so this figure um, Kristen gave me, which shows the total appointments for the years 2018 in blue and 2019 in orange. Um, things got a little wacky with um, the pandemic. So we don't, uh, our numbers for 2020 are uh, way off, but she also sent me some information about um, what they've been doing um, since the beginning of the year. So um, currently we have 23 active clinical trials. Um, since the beginning of January, they've seen 438 appointments um, and enrolled, um, seen uh, 119 patients and enrolled 80 of those into, into clinical trials. So. They are a, a busy service and they're still kind of building back up after um, kind of uh, having to take a major slowdown during the pandemic, but they are ready to enroll more patients. Some other resources that we have here that um, are, are really nice and, and unique to compared to some other um, veterinary teaching hospitals. Um, we now have two CT scanners, and um, that's just as of March, we added a new um, dual energy CT, which I'm sure there's others on this call that can give you um, all the nitty gritty about it. But um, really, uh, it's from the medical oncologist's perspective, very fast, amazing images and really help us um, get much better perfusion studies. Um, we have an MRI on site, and then we also have um, a pet CT capabilities as well. Um, that's always a little bit logistically more tricky in our veterinary species um, because um, our dogs and cats do need to be anesthetized for their CT scans. So that adds a layer of challenge. And then they also need to be in um, kind of a quarantined in a, a nuke med ward um, until, their, um, until their levels are low enough for them to go home and be with their owners. So um, just some specific, special um, considerations and we're fortunate to have that all on site here. Um, CSU has you know, long been a leader in, um, in the field of radiation oncology. Um, and so, and they continue to lead the field. So um, we're very lucky with um, the, the linear accelerator that we have, our ability to do stereotactic body radiation therapy. I'm sure the RADONC team would tell you that, that they're ready for a, a new LINAC, a new fancy one, um, but they still do amazing work with, with what they have. Um, so that's a great resource to have and still kind of the envy of many of the veterinary schools around the country. And then um, some new toys, a superficial x-ray, a radiator, um, which um, the team is getting up and moving. And so this is great for superficial lesions um, and intraoperative applications. Um, you know, so this is just a, um, a third eyelid tumor on a horse, probably a squamous cell carcinoma. I'm not sure what this guy has. This could be a mass or it could be up by his eyelid, but he just looks like trouble in general. So, um, uh, he uh, looks like a perfect application for um, this uh, superficial irradiator. 
Okay, any questions so far about who we are, what we have at our disposal before I jump into to talking a little bit more specifically about comparative oncology? And I can't see the chat, so if there's something in there, someone will have to yell it out. Nope. Okay, hearing none, Just I will move. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, just for quick, the if you want to in the reactions, there's a little raise your hand. So if you have a question, you want to raise your hand. If you put that up, I can, I'll kind of moderate and let the speaker know. So if anything comes to mind. So sorry, Jenna. Yeah. No, that's great. Thank you, Dan. Okay, so why companion animals? Um, so why why do we think that our dogs and cats and potentially other species with cancer can really help with the drug development? Um, uh, for, for therapies for people. Well, um, as, as most of you know, our patients have spontaneously arising cancers and cancer is very common in, um, in our dogs and cats that we see. Um, so these arise naturally dogs and cats just and other species just get developed cancer. Um, and these tumors arise in fully immunocompetent hosts. So that helps with some of the, the things that Steve is gonna talk about um, as far as you know, looking at new immunotherapies and that sort of thing. Um, the tumors that our pets develop often have a very similar histologic appearance, biologic behavior, and um, the tumors that, that they get reflect the tumor heterogene heterogeneity that's seen also in people. So. Um, these two dogs, Clarence and Charlie, um, different breeds, golden retriever um, and a Labrador retriever, uh, live in the same house owned by the same owner. Um, both happen to get osteosarcoma in the same leg. Um, you can't see in this picture, but they're both missing a left hind leg. Um, but still, um, their, their osteosarcoma is going to be slightly different from one another. Um, so just reflecting kind of the broad behavior that we can see, um, with different, um, different tumors and different individuals. Um, you know, our, our, I'm considered an abnormality now because I don't let my dog sleep in my bed or sit on my furniture, but you know, these pets are literally sharing beds with us. They're drinking the same water. Um, often they're sharing the same food. Um, you know, we're walking on the same grass and breathing the same air. So um, I think we, I'm excited, you know, to hear what Rod is going to talk about because we haven't done a lot with the fact that these animals are living in the same spaces that we are. Um, and our, our pets also have clinically relevant responses, both good and bad to the investigational product, products. And they have owners that are living with them at home that are very pay attention to their pets with cancer and give us detailed feedback about what they're seeing and what they feel their pet is experiencing. So that's really um, helpful, um, especially when we're assessing adverse events of a, of a novel therapy. Um, dogs and cats live shorter lives than we do. So um, these animals have compressed pro progressions and survival time. So often we can generate information um, much more quickly um, than what can be done in people just because the time progression um, just moves more quickly. And we're, these, these animals have the potential to be less heavily pretreated standard of care for many of our tumor types um, is a bit more loosely defined. And so um, these are owners that are making decisions for their pets that are paying for the cost of cancer therapy out of pocket. So while we may have therapies and protocols that we know are most effective, that may be time-wise or financially out of the reach for some owners. And so they may elect um, you know, a less aggressive treatment protocol, or they may elect to roll into a clinical trial where they could get some um, potential therapy for their pet um, at a reduced or, or sometimes even at um, no cost. And then I, I think another important thing is that we have a very high degree of co cooperation from pet owners. Um, they're often very motivated, um, you know, people that we meet with refer to their pets as their kids. And, um, so they are very invested in their 
care and well-being and I'm very committed to the trials that they do enroll in. So I'm sure many of you have seen this figure before. Um, you know, the top part of it is just outlining what classically the, the drug development um, pipeline has been. And this is just proposing where companion animals may um, provide you know, value added information as part of that. So either in parallel or prior to early phase studies in people um, and contributing all along there. So I'm just gonna talk about um, a, a couple studies where dogs have been incorporated into um, the, the drug development pipeline. Um, as I put this together, I realized that these are all using dogs with lymphoma. So I'm really hoping Don and Steve are gonna focus on other tumor types because um, I, I did not, <laughs> I apologize. Um, so the first study that I'm, that I'm gonna talk about um, was involving dogs with B cell lymphoma kind of in the early development of a Bruton tyr tyrosine kinase inhibitor, which we now know to be um, ibrutinib. Um, and so in this kind of preclinical study were included eight dogs that were actually um, treated here. So um, this portion of the study was led by Doug Pham. Um, and so these dogs either had naive or relapsed B cell lymphoma. They were, were received the drug daily and had weekly visits. And um, as part of the study, um, there was, uh, they had collected uh, PBMCs, lymph node biopsies, and then also um, their response to treatment was assessed. So the goal really was to get, um, to, to validate um, the target um, value, validate modulation of the target with the drug and then get some early response data. And so um, they were very successful in that. So this is just a Western blot looking at um, uh, BTK in the PBMCs and the lymph nodes. And so um, this is pre-treatment, four hours, 24 hours, and seven days. Um, pre-treatment biopsies, 24 hours post um, first treatment and then seven days after treatment initiation. So the ability to get repeated biopsies here. Um, you know, they found that a single dose was sufficient to occupy um, BTK in both the uh, PBMCs and the, the lymph node or tumor tissue. Um, you know, we did note that um, the BTK levels were varied across the samples. And so, you know, is this due to tumor heterogeneity? You know, looking at some of it, um, I wonder if sometimes, you know, it might just be a, a, a biopsy sample miss, which, you know, happens. Maybe we didn't get the tissue that we thought we were getting. Um, or could this be potential drug-induced changes in um, peripheral blood um, BTK expression levels? Um, they did see some, um, uh, some efficacy in these dogs with three of the eight dogs um, having a, a partial response and three having stable disease for a period of time. So um, just one example of how dogs really contributed in a small way to help, um, you know, validate the target and then, val and then um, confirm target modulation with a drug. So um, uh, another example here is um, evaluation of a drug that used to be known as GS9219, um, which is a, a pro-drug of um, the nucleotide analog PMEG. And this drug preferentially accumulates in, um, in um, lymphoid tissue. And so this was, this is purely um, a dog only study, whereas previously the dogs were just a small por portion of that um, bigger preclinical pre study. And this was a phase one, phase two clinical trials in which 38 dogs were enrolled um, here and at the University of Wisconsin. And so one of the goals of this study was to, to better define the, the dosing schedule of this drug. So dogs, um, there were four different dosing schedules and two different dosing levels in each group. Um, as part of this study, you know, there was um, PK evaluation of the drug in the plasma and the PBMCs, and then some response as, uh, assessment as well. Most of the dogs just had caliper measurements of the tumor, but as this figure shows, um, some dogs also got, um, had PET CT scans to assess response. So looking at it, um, 
um, the results of this study, they identified that the plasma half-life was quite short, but they did see that the, um, the drug accumulated in the lymphoid cells at high levels. Um, we helped um, identify the toxicity profile. So uh, not unexpectedly GI myelosuppression, but also saw some unusual dermatologic um, side effects. And, and those side effects not unexpectedly occurred at the highest dose intensities and dose levels in those dogs. And um, interestingly, we did see significant anti-tumor activity, which is highlighted here in the PET-CT. So pretreatment um, scan, this was on day five. And then this was about 15 weeks. So three weeks after um, uh, five uh, treatment cycles. So, and the dog um, at this point was in a, a had a complete response. So, um, this study really helped define that the, the dose schedule that they initiated the human phase one trial. Um, and so they went with a, a dosing of um, Q3 weeks for this. Unfortunately, um, drug development in people was discontinued to um, unacceptable safety profile. And, and we don't know anything beyond that. Um, and so I think this highlights one of our challenges that we'll discuss in a little bit, um, but it wasn't a total loss as this drug went on to be developed as a canine um, lymphoma drug and was recently gained full FDA approval um, for canine lymphoma is now called Tenovia. So not all was lost, but, um, but we were the bigger winners on that one, which is rare. Um, just a couple more studies. Uh, I, I chose this one because this is a very, um, this study is really PKPD rich and I think highlights um, the kind of samples that we can get and what our clients um, are, are willing actually to do as part of these studies. So this study um, was funded through the NCI and was conducted through the um, COTC mechanism. Um, and so there were nine COTC, uh, COTC sites and a total of 84 dogs that are eventually enrolled. And this was a phase one study looking at these three identoisoquinolones. And um, so these drugs had been in development at the um, NCI. And actually the study was conducted in, in parallel with phase one studies, a phase one study of um, LMP 400 and LMP 776. Um, LMP 744 kind of had been put on the back burner because they just weren't excited, that excited about the drug based on the, the preclinical models. But um, for some reason, the decision was made to test it in dogs anyways, um, just to get a little bit more information about the activity. So um, again, the main, the main goals of the study were to get information about the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of the drug, um, the tox profile, and then get some hints at, at efficacy. So this figure just shows the, the treatment schedule that happened here. And so prior to treatment, you know, baseline blood work and um, lymph node biopsies, uh, lymph node aspirates, bone marrow aspirates. The drug was then administered as an hour infusion once daily for five days. Um, on the first day, additional biopsies, lymph node biopsies were obtained at two and six hours. We got additional tumor aspirates. They had blood drawn um, over 24 hours for um, pharmacokinetic analysis. And then on day six, so 24 hours after the last infusion, dogs had yet another lymph node biopsy, aspirates, bone marrow aspirate, and then another PK um, blood sample collection throughout the day. And then we saw them back pretty much on a weekly basis. Super busy slide, so sorry. Um, but basically the, the big takeaways from this study is that um, they did see downregulation of TOPE 1 as expected. And then this first figure over here shows the increase in gamma H2AX um, induction in the lymph node biopsy samples. So pre-dose two hours and six hours for all three drugs. Um, there was some surprises for what we saw as far as um, the, the PK profile. PKPD profile for um, LMP744. So um, this drug had a much longer half-life than the other two drugs. And, and this figure is showing that, um, that 
LMP744 had a much higher tumor concentration at day six as compared to six hours. So six hours is on the Y, um, day six is on the X. And if, I, I don't know if you can see it, I can barely see it from here. Um, you can see that these concentrations are much higher than um, what it went out to for the other two drugs. Um, so there was tumor response noted for all three agents. And in, um, interestingly at all, all dose levels for 744. Um, and then um, we got more information about the toxicity profile. So GI myelosuppression for all three, and then um, hypersensitivity was another um, side effect identified for 744. So based on this information that we gained from the dog, and remember this is a drug that wasn't gonna move forward um, into phase one studies in people, they did elect to initiate a phase one study in, in um, adults with relapsed solid tumors and lymphomas. And that uh, started back in 2017 and is still ongoing to my knowledge. Last one, promise, one more lymphoma study. Um, so this is just a evaluation of a, um, uh, a selective inhibitor of nuclear export. And so um, there are two, um, two molecules that um, Cariofarm was looking at, um, to my understanding. And so the KPT330 um, is what they move forward for people. And then the very similar drug KPT335 um, was investigated in this preclinical study um, in dogs. And so they did a lot of work in this study. And so they combined a lot of things. So they did some in, in vitro work looking at um, expression of XPO1 in both human and canine diffuse large B cell um, cell lines and um, primary cell cultures um, and found that um, these compounds had um, potent activity they did um, a healthy research beagle study looking at PK, and then they also included a phase one study in dogs with lymphoma. Most of the dogs had lymphoma. There were a few with osteosarcoma or mast cell tumor based on their in vitro work. Um, and so um, similar to the other studies, they gathered similar information and um, the, the dog data really helped to contribute to the um, accelerated FDA approval of cell and extra um, for diffuse large B cell in people. And then this, this molecule, KPT-335, has recently received conditional approval for canine lymphoma. So quick challenges. Um, so as we mentioned with the GS-9219 drug, um, you know, the toxicity profile in companion animals certainly may differ, differ from people. We see a lot of the, the same things, but, you know, we don't always, we're not always able to predict what our dogs may experience or cats versus um, what may happen in people. I think one of our big hurdles um, that, that we face is that we're often lacking canine specific reagents. And this is um, particularly true for immunologic studies. Um, our, the tumors that we see in veterinary medicine are generally less well characterized as far, as far as their molecular and genetic alterations. Although, you know, Dr. Duval has been um, really helping us move us forward in this front. Um, and so, and, and also likewise, um, sometimes we know a lot less about the tumor microenvironment, but um, Dr. Dow and Dr. Regan, um, that's areas of active research for them. Um, we know that we sometimes see different oncogenic mutations and similar histologies. So for example, in canine melanoma, the BRAF mutations um, are infrequent. Um, we see BRAF mutations actually in our urothelial carcinomas. Um, but interestingly, even in those canine melanomas, the ERK um, and or PI3 kinase signaling pathways appear to be activated despite the lack of those mutations. And then, you know, I think funding for um, the studies to do, to answer some of these questions or overcome some of these hurdles sometimes is um, a bit limited in veterinary medicine. So, um, so just another uh, challenge that we face. And that's all I've got. Um, so I would be happy to open it up to questions. Um, I'd love to stop hearing my own voice for a little bit. Dr. Burton, can I start it off? 
I'd love it. Yes, please. So first off, welcome back to the Cancer Center. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So I, you know, I, I think these, 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 uh, you know, your the examples you showed are, are are really quite striking, and one of them actually is I think indicates the answer to my question. But I'm wondering, you know, for example, with the top one inhibitor, it went into trials in humans not only in lymphoma but in solid cancers, and I wonder, is that, you know, because the 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 spectrum of cancers is overlapping between dogs and humans, particularly particularly dogs and children, but less overlapping with older adult cancers, which are mostly carcinomas in humans. And so how well can results from these clinical trials in dogs, can they still inform clinical trials in humans, perhaps with the same drug, even if not for the same cancer? Yeah, I, that's a really good question. And so we actually had talked about um, trying to ex expand into soft tissue sarcomas and um, I can't remember all the conversations as to why that didn't happen or we couldn't pull it off the ground, but I, I think, you know, they were intrigued enough by the amount of drug accumulation that occurred in the, those lymph nodes um, that it would have been nice if we could have shown that in soft tissue sarcomas and dogs. But, um, you know, at this point, we don't have a reason that, that that wouldn't occur in some sort of solid tumor. But, you know, again, um, it would be nice to have that ad additional information. Yeah, because I can imagine, let's say with the topo one inhibitor, if there's mouse data that shows it can be effective, maybe in a carcinoma model, and then you have the real world dog data, and that is a larger animal, and they're living in human environments, that you can almost sort of combine those sets of data to say that, and you've also got the PKPD in a large animal, mm -hmm. to provide a rationale for a clinical trial in humans in a different cancer even though it wasn't what was tested in the mouse model. Even, I'm not the mouse model, I'm sorry, in the dogs. I'm so used to mice. Yeah. <laughs> That's quite all right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's a really um, interesting question, James. And I think the interesting thing is, as we, you know, is when, after Dawn's talk, when she talks about molecular characterization, you know, can we, if we define cancer as a molecular disease instead of just a hist histotype, right, or as a hist histopathological disease, then that could really change that ability to, you know, go cross, you know, histotypes with regards to, to treatment. Um, and so I think that's, you know, that's, that's been, I think, some of the frustration is people, you know, we've run into, they're like, oh, for doing breast cancer, there's, you know, dogs don't get breast cancer, which yeah. is exactly true, but, um, you know, can soft tissue sarcoma, is it molecularly similar enough or with the drug you're using, is it targetable enough that you could actually do that? So I think that's, it's a great question and interesting. I actually wrote that down as a provocative question, kind of histotype specificity, <laughs> you know, do, do we have to worry about histotype or can we molecularly or some other way characterize these tumors with regards to outcome? Tough crowd. Yeah, I know. Come on, folks. Get, get chatting. Jen, I have, a, I have a question about kind of dogs for predicting adverse events in, in human trials. This has been something that um, I know you kind of brushed over a little bit, but um, do, you, do you think we're smart enough to use some of the data we get in dogs to be more predictive in terms of adverse events in, in humans when, when those drugs move on? So is the question, are, is it, is it a valid model or is it drug dependent or? What, what are the barriers, I guess? And, oh. and is the physiology similar enough that you can do that? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just making guesses here, but I, I mean, I think we see a lot of, um, similar toxicities with, with drugs that we've been using for years that we've just, you know, doxorubicin, vincristine, cyclophosphamide, that, you know, we see a lot of the similar things. Um, I think in veterinary, in veterinary oncology, we're a little bit more cautious with our um, dosing with some of those same drugs that have been used in people just for the avoidance of side effects um, in these companion animals. So 
um, you know, we could miss things um, a little bit if we are um, treating a little bit less aggressively or, or differently. But I feel like with these control, you know, with doing kind of these phase one like studies, um, we're, we're using the same parameters and defining dose limiting toxicities in the same, in a similar manner. So I think we should have hints. Paula Jenik has a question. So, Paula. Maybe we can't hear her. Well, yeah, while we we're trying to get um, Paula interacting with us. So I know Dan has talked a little bit about like the GI tract being kind of a uh, shock organ for the dog. So do you think that you get more GI side effects in uh, dogs than you, than people might have, or is that where my dog studies throw off some of the, the, um, side effects associated with a given drug, do you think? Um, I think that that's true with the GI being the, the shock organ. So we do see a fair amount of GI signs secondary to our chemo. Um, I guess that's hard for me to answer that just because um, I, I don't treat people. So I don't, um, I, um, but yeah, I, I think it could be. And so, and are there other organs that are, are less likely to be affected um, because there's something unique about the dog or the cat? Um, you know, if you use that logic, then we shouldn't see, you know, cats, the, the, the lungs are more the shock organ. And so, you know, we shouldn't see as many GI signs um, as we do in dogs, but I still feel like we, we still see a fair amount in cats. I don't know, that's a total non-answer. Yeah, I guess uh, I, I kind of set you up there because it's like, well, I didn't know how bad they are in people. <laughs> so <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> I, think, uh, um, oh. I, I think we can look at the, um, the concept of using older uh, dogs or cats with uh, concurrent diseases in uh, kind of a, a, a number of different uh, lights, I think, for GI tract, if we can identify a way to mitigate uh, significant GI symptoms, then be pretty confident that that's going to work in people as well, if they have those symptoms, just because that is um, that is such a common situation. And then also, I think the, um, the uh, toxicity in the liver of an older dog with concurrent disease is so much different than it is in a young beagle that's used for uh, dog studies or in a mouse. So, you know, I think there are interesting concepts of how you might be able to um, mitigate some of the uh, more common adverse events in people by using older, older patients uh, that have cancer and studying mechanisms that are going to work in, in those patients rather than assuming if it, if it uh, works in a young dog or a young mouse, that's going to work in a person. Yeah, that's a, that that's a good point. Um, so Paula sent it, put a ta put a, a note up in the um, chat. Um, she was talking about the the talk yesterday in the in the cancer center. Um, the director of the rare melanoma group that she has a lot of interest in um, oral melanomas. And I know I've talked a little bit in the past with Bill Robinson about this, but I do think that the rare melanoma similarity might be something to, to pursue um, just the non-cutaneous. So mel melanoma folk, I think that's something to think about. Jenna, I think it also might be useful for you to talk a little bit about the um, nature of our um, of our biorepository and what we have available, what we might want to make available or, or to collect, and how we might be able to uh, ask for some help in terms of what would be most useful for uh, comparative work uh, going forward. We have 
I'll, I'll let you talk about it, but I think that's a big, big part of our resource here as well. Uh, yes, and I'm don't want to put you on the spot, Sue, but I'm happy to turn it over to Sue Lana, who runs that program. Um, so I'll watch for you to unmute, but I'll keep talking until you do. <laughs> so we're um, so under Sue's leadership, um, the, the Cancer Center has long had a biorepository program where we collect um, tumor tissue um, fluids, so blood, urine, um, and then we can store those. And she's unmuted, so I'll let her jump in from here. Yeah, thanks, Jenna. Um, we collect uh, with client consent and uh, CRB, or I it used to be IACUP, now CRB approval, tumor tissue, normal tissue, body fluids from patients at the time of um, prior to treatment, typically. Um, we've started to collect uh, samples that are longitudinal, so especially in some of the diseases that we work in more commonly, like osteosarcoma, bladder cancer, and some lymphomas will collect them periodically over the course of their treatment. And then at the time of relapse, one of the things that we would love to collect more of, but um, it's more challenging, of course, is metastatic samples. So having paired um, primary and metastatic samples would be quite valuable in a variety of our tumor types. And we have a few of those, um, but our um, archive is largely uh, surgical based is how we get our tissue samples. The body fluids that we collect, including um, streck tubes for um, uh, cell-free DNA is, is pretty straightforward at, at any time point. We also have the staff and, and are trying to expand our um, correlation of our outcome data for our patients. So especially again, in the diseases that we're most interested in, um, osteosarcoma over time, what were you treated with? When did you die? When did you relapse? Um, those are our pieces that we've added in the last couple of years to try to make the tissues that, um, for example, Dawn uses and, and may talk about a little bit later, more valuable as far as um, what happened to those patients and how can we correlate it to the things that she's finding. We also work on, um, I'll call them investigator collections. So, um, if someone has a special need for a particular tumor type or a particular um, sample processing methodology that they're looking for, um, we can work in that confines as well in those structures. So the infrastructure is set up um, and we have standard collection protocols and then we can vary those as needed depending on what the um, investigators might want. Um, one of the things that often occurs is um, people sometimes forget, you know, these are client-owned animals, and while we um, collect multiple samples and multiple time points, we're still limited in some of the things that we can do. And so if you have an idea and you're interested, if we have that type of tissue in the freezer or in blocks or something, um, if we don't have what you need, perhaps we can have a conversation about alternatives to what you need and you know, can we do it based on um, a different type of sample or something, depending on what your assays are and what you're um, looking at. So that's kind of in a nutshell, our biorepository. Awesome. Thank, thanks, Sue. Um, so I, I think that... Um, Thanks everybody. I, I like the interaction. Um, let's move on and try to stay on on time as close as we can. Our next speaker's uh, Dr. Duvall, and she's going to talk about the molecular genetics of uh, canine tumors. So, Don, it's all yours. All right. And I'm not as familiar with Zoom, so hopefully it works okay. Um, It's got a green box around it, so I think I'm I'm okay here. Yep, we can see it. All right. Um, okay, so I'm just going to go ahead and um, spend, you know, the next twenty minutes trying to buzz through some of the things that we've learned about 
um, canine cancers over the last few years. And so, um, as Jenna mentioned, one of the kind of things that we've known was lacking was the kind of the molecular characterization of canine tumors. And so following the IOM meeting that was held a few years ago, um, there was a call from the uh, cancer centers around the country to implement some extended programs to start exploring the immune environment and then the molecular characterization of a number of different canine tumors. And so uh, some of the data that I've got is, is um, coming from that, um, but there are other uh, universities around the country that are exploring different canine cancers. And so first I'm gonna buzz through some of those. Um, the uh, only, as far as I know, the only pan canine cancer um, analysis just came out uh, this month. And so I'm gonna follow that up by kind of exploring that pan canine cancer paper in a little bit more detail. And um, that paper also compares those, the canine cancers that were uh, studied with the uh, pathways that are activated in the um, comparative human cancers. And then I'm gonna dive a little bit deeper into some of the work that we've been doing to uh, characterize tumors here at CSU. So with that, I'll go ahead and, and get started. So the first cancer that I wanna talk about, and that's probably because everybody, I think everybody associated with that P30 extension decided to start looking at osteosarcoma. Um, so the first paper that came out was <clears throat> from the Broad Institute and what they identified, they did a study that looked at 66 dogs um, from three different breeds. So kind of a breed specific focus and uh, looked at osteosarcoma, did mostly whole exome sequencing in these tumors. And what they identified was that within these tumors about, uh, about 80% of the tumors carried either P53 mutations or copy number aberrations. Also in that study, they identified that around 21% of those uh, samples carried mutations, usually inactivating mutations in the tumor uh, suppressor set D2. So that kind of got the ball rolling. And then from there, there's this study that was conducted a little bit more recently um, a combination study working between TGen and then. Um, primarily Cheryl London at Tufts and Ohio uh, State, and they looked at both whole genome sequencing and whole exome sequencing in a couple of panels of dogs. And like the prior study, they identified a very a high number of uh, mutations in the P53 pathway. Their numbers came in at around 79%. And then they also identified, um, in addition to the single nucleotide variants in set D2, they also identified structural variants in a number of, um, in the set D2 gene, uh, bringing the number of, of animals bearing these types of variants up to about 42% of their samples. In addition, uh, they also uh, found kind of specific to structural variants that there were a number of animals that carried uh, structural variants in this dystrophin gene or the DMD gene. And uh, this gene has also been linked to the increased incidence of rhabdomyosarcoma in children. So this was kind of a new interesting finding. And then another uh, gene that was commonly identified in uh, pediatric osteosarcomas were variants in the DLG2 gene. Um, and they also identified structural variants in about 25% of those, of those animals. Um, next tumor that I wanted to take a look at were um, canine bladder transitional cell carcinomas. And a number of people have conducted studies, um, including us. So uh, one of the first studies was a collaboration between Elaine Ostrander and Debbie Knapp to look at uh, canine uh, bladder cancers. And they identified 
the activating homolog to the V600E mutation in BRAF in three of four RNA sequencing samples that they conducted. We also did whole exome sequencing in um, canine bladder cancer and determined that that variant was present in around 70%, 67 to 70% of our uh, samples. And then um, but a number of other people have looked at using urine DNA and uh, Matthew Breen has developed a very effective molecular diagnostic screen of urine to identify this, this variant in uh, dogs as, a, <clears throat> as an improved method mechanism for diagnosing um, bladder cancer at an earlier stage in, in those animals. We've continued on to start to try and characterize some of the dependencies or, you know, uh, dependencies, not the word I'm looking for, but some vulnerabilities of these tumors for targeting. So of course, because uh, BRAF is the driving mutation in most of these tumors, we uh, explored the use of um, MAP kinase inhibitors in those. We found that uh, vimorafenib was not particularly effective in these tumors, and I'll go into that a little bit later um, with some of the studies that we found that we had synergism between um, uh, uh, growth factor signaling and then MAP kinase signaling in targeting these canine bladder cancers. Um, so uh, another group, another tumor that's had a fair amount of attention is looking at the mutational landscape in oral melanomas. So uh, one of the early studies that came out, again, a collaboration <clears throat> between various uh, uh, institutions around um, veterinary schools around the country and TGEN was looking at um, canine malignant melanomas. Uh, they ran 37 samples in this study, and they identified uh, within those samples that about 24% of them carried mutations in either K, N, or HRAS. There was a high prevalence of MDM2 amplifications. And then they were particularly intrigued by the presence of these uh, inactivating PTPRJ mutations, which they felt might also lead to activation of the MAP kinase pathway in these canine melanomas. Um, other uh, mutations are kind of shown here on the side and here in a little bit of a um, pie chart. And a more recent paper looked at cross-species genomic comparisons between humans, dogs, and horses. And in that study within dogs, they had uh, around 65 dogs in their study, and they found a slightly lower presence of KRAS mutations. And then also um, kind of surprisingly, because no one has been able to pick them up before, they found that about 3% of their samples carried BRAF mutations. Um, we, uh, Jenna focused a lot on lymphomas. Um, and I think we're kind of waiting for some more lymphoma studies to come out. This one was published again by the Broad. And in this study, they did a combination of looking at both B and T cell lymphomas in dogs. And again, focused primarily on two or three specific breeds. Um, within their uh, B cell lymphomas, you can see here in the upper pie chart, they found uh, the presence of some uh, mutations that are similar to those identified in human B cell lymphomas. And then down here at the bottom, um, it seems like there's, I, I don't know as much about T cell lymphomas, but it looks like there are kind of a lot of passenger mutations associated with this, as well as some mutations of P10 that might be um, driving that uh, T cell lymphoma. Uh, the, I think this is the last specific tumor study that I'm going to look at. There were there have been a couple of studies looking at the landscape of hemangiosarcomas, um, kind of rare from the human perspective, but fairly common amongst dogs. This first one came out of um, Penn uh, from Nikki Mason and looked at 21 cases of hemangiosarcoma. And in this one, they found that the 
predominant mutations associated with hemangiosarcomas are mutations in this PI3 kinase pathway. They also carry a lot of mutations in the P53 pathway. Uh, this more recent paper, again from a combination study uh, from the Broad, looked at 47 hemangiosarcoma cases. I think all 47 of these were from uh, golden retrievers. And again, uh, uh, prevalence of mutations in the PI3 kinase pathway and P53 pathways. So um, just recently in Nature Communications, uh, uh, Ying Zhao at University of Georgia uh, collected 684 cases of uh, canine cancer um, across seven different cancer types and 35 different breeds worldwide. And so she basically uh, did some quality control checks on these different uh, canine uh, whole exome, whole genome uh, sequencing samples and started to look at the uh, mutational landscape. And so one of, I think, the questions that has been um, a little bit emerging is just whether or not the breeds uh, really drive the mutational landscape. And so from that perspective, we know that a lot of uh, the large and giant breeds have a tendency to develop osteosarcoma. We know that uh, Bernese mountain dogs uh, have, you know, a prevalence of, of mass, I think, histiocytic sarcomas. Um, and so we know there are specific breeds that get specific tumors. Uh, Scottish Terriers have like a 18 fold increased incidence of bladder tumor. And so she, uh, looking across the mutational landscape, she determined that the uh, driving variants that seem to be involved in different tumors in the dog are largely tumor type dependent, but independent of the breed of uh, the dog. So um, although there are GWAS studies that have identified specific, bear, uh, specific polymorphisms that may contribute to the development of a specific tumor in a breed. Once the, the actual tumor is developed, it seems like the drivers themselves are fairly consistent. Um, and then they found that each tumor type has major pathway alterations that are very similar to those that are found in the human counterpart. And so her study focused primarily on looking at mammary tumors, gliomas, B-cell lymphomas and T-cell lymphomas, oral melanomas, osteosarcomas, and hemangiosarcomas, again, largely from the studies that I've already talked about. So um, this slide uh, shows basically the, the prevalent mutations that she identified in her reanalysis of each of these different tumor types. Um, across those 684 samples. And so at the top, we have the different breeds that were explored. Here in the middle, we have the specific small, um, small single nucleotide variants or small insertions and deletions that are associated with those cancers. And then at the bottom, we we uh, she shows the amplifications and deletions that were identified in those samples. So here, the first one that we see is mammary tumors, and you can see that mutations, again, in this PI3 kinase uh, pathway are prevalent within these mammary tumors. Um, and then all the, the uh, ones that are shown here with the, the stars are those that are statistically significant recurrent mutations within those tumor types. So that one being the, the most prevalent in the mammary tumors. When we look at the uh, glioblastomas, uh, again, we see that there, the most prevalent one is this called one gene. There are also isocitrate dehydrogenase mutations that are observed in canine uh, glioblastomas. And then uh, one of the, some of the prevalent uh, changes that they see are deletions associated with the uh, CDK and 2A, and then right next to it on the genome is this MTAP gene. When we look at our B cells and our T cell uh, lymphomas, you can see that the, the variants that she pulled out in her uh, reanalysis of 
these uh, tumors are very similar to those that were pulled out by the, the Broad in their analysis. Um, uh, and uh, you can see, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not gonna, I'm just gonna stop there, I guess. Again, uh, commonly see deletions in CDK in 2A. And then here we move on back to our oral melanoma. And again, you can see that uh, NRAS, KRAS mutations are prevalent. And then associated with that is alterations in the P53 pathway associated with the amplification of MDM2. Again, osteosarcomas, P53 is kind of the thing that really sticks out in osteosarcomas. Again, we see deletions in that region of uh, the genome that includes CDK N2A and the MTAP genes in these, in these tumors. And then uh, last, but I suppose not least, we go back to our hemangiosarcoma. And again, here we see P53 present in over 50% of the tumors that were analyzed, and then also activating mutations in this PI3 kinase pathway. So the next thing that she went ahead and did was compared the prevalence of different specific mutations and pathway changes in humans um, here along the x-axis and then canine tumors here along the y-axis and basically just to look and determine how similar the different uh, tumor types were. So one thing that they noted was that when they looked at the mammary tumors um, and breast cancer tumors in the canine, they identified that a very specific variant, the PIK3CAH1047 variant, was mutated in over 25% of the mammary tumors of both species. So, and you can see that here, uh, this activating mutation in PIK3CA. Um, pathways are illustrated by the dark spots. Um, and you can see that while P53 was uh, more prevalent in the humans, it's uh, somewhat less prevalent in the dog tumors. Uh, when we look at, uh, jumping to another one, if we look at osteosarcoma, um, we again see that P53 is mutated in greater than 25% of osteosarcomas um, in both species, and it's uh, greater than 50% in, in canine um, tumors. And kind of to reiterate, when we look at the oral or mucosal melanomas, what you see is that the MDM2 is amplified in over 40% of both tumor uh, of those tumor types in both species. Um, when they looked at specific genes versus pathways, they found that the uh, greatest homology was at the pathway level. So um, you might see you know, for the example, in bladder cancers, where you might see RAS mutations, um, you, in the canine model, you would see the BRAF mutations as a comparison. She did not include any bladder uh, samples in her study. So um, one resource that people might be able to start to use in the future is the Integrated Canine Data Commons. So this is a... Um, an endeavor on the part of the NCI to start to accumulate data on the um, on the driving mutations, the transcriptomes of different canine tumors. This is a link to that integrated canine data common, commons. They're working very diligently to try and accumulate data into that uh, repository right now. Currently, they're at about 509 samples. Um, and I think it's just mostly that people lack the time to get their data uploaded into the data commons is one of the limiting factors right now. So now I'm going to st uh, stop. I don't know how far off I am on time, probably pretty far off. We've looked at canine bladder cancer. I mentioned that 70% of them are BRAF mutant. 
We've compared our, uh, the transcriptomes of BRAF mutant and wild type tumors, and we find that they cluster separately by principal components analysis. And then we see different um, markers enriched in the mutant versus the BRAF wild type tumors. And then we've also, you know, because so many of them are, are BRAF mutant, we have explored um, different MAP kinase uh, inhibitors in, in targeting these tumors. Um, as I mentioned before, vimorafenib is not very effective in these tumors. Uh, all of the tumors that we examined were heterozygote for mutations in the BRAF. Uh, gene, and so it may be due to the paradoxical activation of wild-type BRAF in these tumors. We found that trametinib was far more effective in, in um, targeting these BRAF mutant TCCs, and uh, that in when we look at gene expression analysis of the epidermal growth factor pathway, we see a lot of activation in these tumors, and so combination therapies with MEK inhibitors and herb B, uh, pan herb B inhibitors show synergism. We've also looked at the immune environment in these tumors. And what we can see in those tumors is that um, we've looked at both immune cell markers. We have immune cold and immune hot tumors um, based on gene expression analysis. We see when we look at the um, actual CD3 staining with immunohistochemistry, uh, largely that's reiterated that the ones that show a tumor hot environment also have higher levels of CD3 staining. And, uh, and again, that's a little bit better when we look at the CD3 messenger RNA levels. We've also explored some signatures that um, we pulled out of the human literature that would indicate uh, uh, different, the different uh, markers for uh, immune responses. So we have a CD8T effector signature, which was again elevated in our tumor microenvironment hot tumors. These also show elevation in an interferon gamma signature. Um, what we did not see was an association between tumor microenvironment hot tumors and the tumor mutational burden um, in our tumors. We've also looked at some markers that are associated with response to PD-1 and PDL1 inhibitors. So in this one, they used the CD8T effector marker, and so we can we see that that uh, that marker signature is elevated in our hot tumors. Um, also associated with that, there's a fibroblast um, TGF beta responsive signature that is associated with the lack of response to these uh, inhibitors. And we see that our hot tumors are uh, lacking that signature. And about half of our cold tumors are, um, are elevated for that TGF beta signature. We've also been working to develop uh, trametinib resistant lines. So here we've developed two different, line, um, two different types of TCC, one that was a BRAF mutant and one that was a BRAF wild type. And we've um, made them both resistant to trametinib and they're also resistant to, um, to uh, ERK inhibitors as well. And then these are going to be utilized in some synthetic lethal screens to explore uh, synthetic lethal interactions in these uh, trametinib resistant cell lines uh, using a library that we've been designing and constructing through the functional genomics core. And so we've kind of settled on a, a library that's going to have five uh, targets, five guide RNAs targeting each gene. And then we have uh, funding to explore these synthetic lethal screens uh, using the, the CCTSI co-pilot um, program in collaboration with Jim Costello. When we move to osteosarcoma, we've also explored um, driving mutations and copy number variations in a panel of around 
uh, 26 different osteosarcoma tumors. We again see about 85% of ours have P53 mutations, 23% have set D2 mutations, again, those being the primary drivers. And then when we look over here, we've looked at copy number variations and we've correlated uh, changes in copy number with changes in gene expression. And those are the genes that are shown here in red. So maybe notably, you can see that we see deletions in P10 and we also see reduced expression of P10 in these tumors. What, um, because like uh, Dr. Lana said, we have such uh, good follow-up with our osteosarcoma, we've looked at the association of different um, gene expression signatures or mutations with survival. And somewhat uh, surprisingly, we found that um, P53 mutant tumors actually had longer survival in um, the samples that we had that were all treated with either doxorubicin or carboplatin or both than uh, P53 wild type tumors or P53 tumors that had um, a null mutation like a truncating mutation or gene deletion. Um, so we're starting, uh, you know, kind of looking at that. What we also note is that those uh, tumors with a short disease-free interval that would include this group have activation or changes in the expression of genes in the BCR, uh, BRCA, and ATR pathways. So it may be associated with changes in the ability to repair DNA. Uh, another marker that we um, that was significant in multivariate analysis was the increased levels of monocytes um, in the uh, tumors with a short disease-free interval. We've been, uh, it's currently sequencing, whole exome sequencing of soft tissue sarcomas and RNA sequencing. We'll use the RNA sequencing again to look at differential gene expression analysis and trying to identify any fusions that might help to drive these tumors. This is an oncoplot showing the top uh, cancer genes that are mutated in these uh, in these soft tissue sarcomas. And then just uh, noting here in red, these were ones that had a uh, characterization as like a peripheral nerve sheath tumor. And within some of those tumors, we've identified um, truncating deletions uh, or truncating mutations and things like NF1. We've also uh, started off looking at specifically canine diffuse large B cell lymphomas. This is an early analysis of about 10 samples. We've expanded that panel to 21 samples. Um, and we're also uh, exploring RNA-seq analysis to identify differential gene expression um, and the identification of fusions. Similar to the uh, study from the Broad, we have also identified variants in some of the genes that they did in this data set and um, we'll explore those a little bit further. And then our last tumor that we've started working on and we're starting to analyze now are canine thyroid tumors. We've done whole exome sequencing on 27 tumor match normal samples. We also have 27 samples that we've done uh, sent for RNA sequencing. And again, we'll identify somatic variants potential copy number changes, uh, differentially expressed genes, and then fusion proteins. And these tumors represent a mix of um, solid, follicular, and compact subtypes of thyroid cancer. And then two to three of the tumors that we've sequenced also show histological evidence of being um, expressing calcitonin uh, and, and are probably C-cell carcinomas. Um, we also have a panel of cell lines. These are the cell lines that we've looked at and um, have also identified uh, putative driver mutations within those cell lines. Those are shown here. And then we have also started to associate some of those driving mutations to uh, different uh, drug sensitivity. So in this case, we ran uh, trametinib through the entire panel of cell lines. And so what you can see here is that MAP kinase pathway drivers like NF1, BRAF, RAS genes 
as well as activated or constitutive ERK-1-2 phosphorylation are associated with sensitivity to trametinib, and that's shown here. And then the negative associations um, are things that have been similarly identified in human cancers, mutations in P53, loss of P10, and activating or constitutive AKT phosphorylation. Um, we've also started developing some new cell lines. So we have, um, I've indicated those here, and we are also sending those new cell lines for whole exome sequencing and RNA-seq analysis to kind of support these comparative pharmacogenomic uh, studies. And finally, going somewhat over, I would like to just acknowledge all of the people that have contributed to the work. So our, um, first of all, I wanted to thank the investigators that generated the canine cell lines, and these are across, you know, basically the entire globe. Um, we also have funding from a number of sources here at CSU, as well as the um, CCTSI and that P30 extension to the um, Cancer Center Support Grant. Um, we have a number of collaborators at the Cancer Center for uh, the Genomics Shared Resource, the Functional Genomics Shared Resource, Bioinformatics, and then here at Colorado State, basically, we are one big happy family that helps each other out quite a bit. And then here within my lab, Sunetra Das is the uh, bioinformatic wizard who has put our canine pipeline together. Rupa is our, uh, our isolator of DNA and quality control expert. And then uh, Katie did most of the bladder cancer um, pharmacogenomic work, um, kind of following up um, from Bell and Hernandez, who started off with that study. And then we have uh, current and prior members in the lab that are um, can, have also contributed to the things I talked about today. Whew, sorry. I was trying to hurry, let you guys talk a little bit. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and if I can figure out how to do that. And um, welcome any questions. All right, questions, comments, thoughts, provocative questions. Okay, how do I make it? How do I make it stop sharing my screen? Ah. There should be red up at the top says stop sharing. Yeah, I think I had to get it off of the um, off of the there. That's better. All right. So, you know, certainly from our perspective, we would welcome interactions with people who are interested in helping us to explore, you know, the comparative aspects in thyroid cancer and um, the diffuse large B cell lymphomas. Um, if, there's, if there's any interest in trying to utilize those. One thing I forgot to mention, we do have a number of the cell lines that we've been working with. In the, and I, in the tissue culture um, core so that they're accessible to members of the cancer center. Um, and we can provide you more information about those cell lines if you're interested in utilizing them. Hey, Don, this is Steve. Mm -hmm. Hey, I wonder if you could comment on the um, value, potential value of of rare, of the dog model for rare human cancers, you know, the dog um, histocytic sarcoma model for longer huns, histocytosis in humans, the cytonasal cancer, anal sac cancers, and the potential utility of those lesser known models. Um, well, I think. I think uh, one of the things we have, we kind of focused and I mean, uh, on the things that we get a lot of um, that are also present in the 
you know, in humans and kind of tended to ignore to some extent some, like you said, some of the lesser known things. So I think as we move forward and um, learn more about those, um, those specific types of canine cancer and what might be the molecular drivers, then we can start to utilize them as kind of a molecular cancer that has similarity to a, a different human cancer is instead of worrying about exactly what tissue type they came from. Um, you know, from my perspective, uh, like the bladder cancer, I don't think it makes a great melanoma model per se, but I think it could be a very effective colorectal cancer model from the perspective that, you know, it carries activating mutations in the MAP kinase pathway. A lot of the resistance to treatment seems to be associated with high activity of uh, epidermal growth factor uh, constituents as well. So um, certainly, you know, that might serve a different type of, you know, to serve as a different type of model. Um, and I don't, you know, as far as some of the other cancers, I just don't know if we know as much about them at this point in time. Yeah, I mean, I think that one of the problems in the in the cancers and molecular disease era in comparative onc has been the lack of information that we've had on tumors. And as this comes pouring in, I think it's kind of allowing us potentially to make those types of molecular comparisons. Well, and and um, so from the perspective, like if we discover something very important in um, say our thyroid cancers that could, you know, very similar to human thyroid cancers, what would our client numbers be like? I mean, how effective would a study, a clinical trial in thyroid cancer be? How quickly could we accumulate a sufficient number to, to test something? Does it, do you have any numbers for like thyroid cancer in, in our clinic? We'd have to, we'd have to clearly do a multi-center trial. Right, yeah. yeah. We'd have to, you know, get our friends together. But you again, know, like- uh, Yeah, I mean- Don, do you know, could you comment on what data is being deposited in the um, ID? ICDC? ICDC, yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, I know that uh, most of, uh, Debbie Knapp has most of her bladder cancer data deposited there. They have a, a uh, Roll Verhack has, you know, they did the glioblastoma study, and they have, I think, 106 samples from that study deposited in there. Um, and then I think the next ones that are coming up are probably the um, TGen, um, Tufts, Ohio State uh, osteosarcoma study is is getting put in there. Other, um, they're they were interacting with uh, Xiaoying Zhao to see about getting that pan cancer study, getting all the data um, from that put in there. Although I think they might have to take the time to go back to the original depositors of that data. Is that all? I mean, it's basically all just um, genetic sequencing data? They, um, like with the glioblastoma, it's also as associated with uh, imaging data. And you know some, uh, I think some histological analysis. So it's not only genomics data. A lot of times, it's also associated if they have images associated with imaging. Thanks. They're also working with the Seven Bridges Group to um, try and help build a platform where people might be able to analyze that data kind of on their own using the Seven Bridges platform for uh, genetic analysis. 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's going to be really telling as we start to get more and more data. If we could start subdividing instead of you know thyroid tumors have you know X mutant thyroid tumors and those get treated differently. I mean, I I know you're kind of thinking about that with p53 mutant osteo in terms of of what to do with that versus wild type. But I, I mean, I do think as we start molecular characterizing the tumors, it's it's going to potentially change. Yeah, I think one of the things that's interesting, you know, in the human realm, uh, osteosarcoma, pediatric osteosarcomas are P53 mutant, but usually those are structural variants. So they basically have a translocation in the first intron. So they're really a lot more like our truncated P53 tumors than they are um, activating mutations or you know, all dominant negative mutations in P53 in the DNA binding domain. So it's a little bit different feel than just the standard missense mutation. Yeah, but I think characterizing those molecularly and the similarities and differences are critical to whether they're, you know, if, if you would treat those similarly or differently or how you, how you would approach that in a clinical trial. Right. Yeah, and I mean, if anybody's interested in trying to find out, you know, more about a specific tumor or, or wants some of the references, I'm happy to to share that information. You know, show share those links with them or that uh, those papers with them. All right. Any more thoughts on kind of the molecular genetics of it's it's hard to digest all the information and think about it. But I, and, you know, I think this can be an ongoing conversation as people are starting to think about anything they glean out of this and how, how they might want to uh, approach a research question. I think that's another thing we're trying to do is connect people today. So see faces, get names, know who to talk to. Okay, uh, without further ado, our next uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Steve Dow. Um, and he's going to talk about immunotherapy in cancer patients. With So with that, Steve, you get to drive the Zoom platform. Very good. Thanks, Dan. OK, hey, great afternoon, guys. Thanks for the opportunity to kind of walk you through what's going on in dog immuno-oncology world. Um, I'm a member of the Cancer Center here at CSU and also an internist at the teaching hospital. And so I've had the opportunity to work in this dog immuno-oncology model for a while now. And it's it's been interesting to see how the how the model has evolved and how the world has come to, I think, appreciate more what dogs have to offer. <clears throat> so just briefly, you know, why we think dogs are valuable as an immunological model for human cancer research. Uh, the, the, immune, the basic immune sub, subsets are all there. They're there in roughly equal numbers. The subsets are well represented. Their functions all appear to be very similar. There are only a few peculiar differences, but I think they're fairly minor and don't really affect really the validity, validity of the dog model. Um, you know, Jenna mentioned earlier the similarities in terms of how the tumors develop. <clears throat> and then I think from the immunological standpoint, um, metabolism and body size actually really matter a lot as well. For example, when you're evaluating cancer vaccines, the vaccines are delivered in similar doses to a body size that's roughly equivalent. So, so those make the model, I think, potentially more relevant. Um, you know, there's, there's discussion off and on about what's lacking in terms of our immune assay portfolio. But I think I would really push back and argue that particularly nowadays, we really have a robust immune toolbox for studying um, immune responses in dogs, um, routine multicolor flow, IHC, we're starting to move into geospatial imaging. We have multiplex cytokine arrays. Um, in the next slide, I'm gonna give you a little bit more information on a new nanostring technology. And then really, I think the next gen sequencing 
platforms are really closing the gaps in terms of what we can study immunologically in dogs compared, to, for example, to humans. And then I really, I wanted to put some emphasis on this last point, because I think sometimes it gets overlooked. And, and that's the, uh, this idea that dogs have a very well-educated immune system, unlike um, our mouse models. So if you think about it, um, the dog immune system has seen lots of things by the time the dog uh, develops cancer. So almost all puppies and, and young dogs develop viral and bacterial infections. <clears throat> they all get vaccinated. They often get repeatedly vaccinated. So by the time cancer rolls around, the immune system has already put a lot of its energy into looking at other things. So it's not, you know, it's not a wide open immune system that can devote its full time and attention to cancer, unlike the mouse <clears throat> who really hasn't seen much of anything except sterile food and water. So <clears throat> when cancers are induced in mice, you know, I would argue the immune system is somewhat artificially able to completely focus on cancer, unlike the case in the dog. So the <clears throat> nuance of the dog immune system, I think is important when we talk about cancer immunity. And then I, I know Dan wants to um, discuss provocative questions, but if somebody has questions during this presentation, feel free to jump in. I did want to um, point out one of the new additions to our toolbox, and that's the Kena and IO panel. So this was developed by the Nanostring company. Um, it was <clears throat> underwritten in part by the, the UL1 program at NCI that's funded really the first targeted funding for canine um, immuno-oncology research. So the panel is really patterned after the human IO360 panel. Um, you know, very similar set of genes, 800 genes, 750 some genes are immune related, 47 annotated immune pathways. <clears throat> and so it's really, a nice tool that we can use to make um, analogies between dog and human immune response. It's also very robust. In fact, we can use nanostring to look at um, gene expression in formalin fixed tissue. So it's really the only platform that allows us to look at transcriptomic responses in that sort of tissue sample. And, and we're exploring other opportunities for the use of nanostring and <clears throat> other canine diseases, but it's, it's actually, it's a very valuable new tool that we have. And <clears throat> also wanted to point out that our lab and others are, are starting to move now into single cell sequencing. And this work in my lab is being driven by Dylan Ammons and Linda Chow, but this is one of our first looks at circulating PBMC in dogs Using single cell sequencing, we're gonna be comparing dogs with osteosarcoma to healthy dogs, seeing if we can identify unique cell populations or signatures. But if you just look at the UMAP here, you can already, I think, understand the power of the technology. And it really, so for example, we can see four subsets of cytotoxic T cells in dogs, Five subset, five to six subsets of CD4 T cells, five to six within the monocytic population. And this really allows us to close the gap with what we can learn in human and mouse models as well. So it's going to be, I think, an increasingly powerful tool that we can use. So um, for if you're studying immune oncology in dogs, there's I think there's some models that make sense some that make more sense than others perhaps. And, and this is just a, you know, a quick snapshot of the major models. And we've sort of roughly classified them into hot and cold um, based on their immune signatures. So osteosarcoma and glioma are relatively cold immunologically, you know, very sparse immune infiltrates, few T cells, really not much going on immunologically, whereas in contrast, melanoma and, and probably transitional cell or urothelial carcinoma as well are fairly immunologically hot or warm tumors. 
So you can kind of pick and choose based on the immune signature as well as the other factors that go into making a good cancer model. And then I don't really know how to classify non-Hodgkin's lymphoma or B-cell lymphoma in dogs because it's, you know, it rises in, in lymph nodes as multicentric disease. It's a difficult tumor to really classify, but it's a, it is still a viable model in, term, in terms of the um, um, immunotherapy immune oncology studies. Um, so I thought what I'd do here is walk you through a little bit of history and then up to the present day and, and really exploring how dogs have advanced um, immune oncology drug development. And most of these um, discussions always start with the liposomal muramil tripeptide discussion. I mean, so LMT, LMTPE, otherwise known as mefamertide, is really the first and only approved adjuvant immunotherapy for osteosarcoma in, in humans. And its approval was based to a large degree on pioneering work done by Greg McCune at the University of Wisconsin, who ran a number of trials looking at um, your milk tripeptide in dogs with osteosarcoma. And out of that work came the realization that um, your milk tripeptide given, again, this is a liposome encapsulated nod agonist given intravenously, which really tends to home to the lungs and activate innate immunity within the lungs. His work showed that the use of this drug could significantly improve both disease-free intervals or net-free intervals and survival times in dogs with osteosarcoma that had undergone conventional cytotoxic chemotherapy um, preceded by amputation. And this work built on the work of Isaiah Fiddler at uh, MD Anderson. Um, and, and really this work was instrumental in getting approval for mefamertide in um, Europe. It, it did not reach the level of approval in the US, but it is an approved drug in, in Europe currently. Um, and I did also want to use this opportunity to point out that uh, the work that Greg McEwen did all built on studies initiated in mice. So really, and, and any of the work I'll mention this afternoon will all be, we should all understand that all the Anything that was done in dog was preceded by work in mice. So the mouse model is still essential, but we would look at the dog as a, it's really, I guess, a, a key validation step in some cases, but it's also, a, a, I think, a way to more efficiently move from mouse to human um, because of the, the, I think, the additional validity that the dog studies bring. Um, so this kind of set the stage for the dog as a model for immunotherapy. Um, sorry, my first introduction to the dog model was as a postdoc in Terry Potter's lab at National Jewish. And at the time I was in the lab, um, there was a lot of interest in superantigens. Um, and these are molecules typically um, produced by enterotoxin producing strains of Staph aureus and, and several other bacteria that are very potent activators of broad swaths of T cells. So an individual super antigen such as Staph enterotoxin B or SEB can activate up to a third of all T cells in a, it's an MHC dependent, but not, but peptide independent fashion. So it was a very potent way to activate T cells. So we were working in a mouse model of melanoma at the time, showing that you could transduce tumors with um, the SEB gene in conjunction with, in, in the studies we were looking at GMCSF. So it was a way to bring T cells and antigen presenting cells together. The mouse data looked promising. Um, I was able to work with colleagues in Denver um, in, the oncology, in the veterinary oncology space to uh, initiate a trial in dogs with melanoma. I mean, I'm, what I'm showing you here on the left are the um, IHC images of tumors before and after injection with the SEB-GMCSF combo 
showing a robust infiltrate of CD4, CD8, and T cells, as well as um, macrophages and monocytes. And so the trial was done, it was an open label trial with um, stage one through three patients. What I'm showing you here is one example of a dog with um, oral melanoma on the lower jaw, heavily pigmented. This is a, a Scotty. So it was, the owners didn't see the tumor for, for a while. So it got to pretty large size. Uh, this is one week after the first injection of this gene combination. You can see the tumor is obviously changing. It's starting to depigment. Um, and then by week three, the tumor is completely regressed. And not, I'm not going to show you the data, but we went on to show that there's a systemic response against these tumors as well. So they developed a dem demonstrable CTL response, and there was a significant improvement in survival and disease-free interval. Um, <clears throat> so I mentioned this because it was, it, was a, it was our first experience translating from mouse to dog, but we were working with um, the CU Cancer Center at that point. This was back when the Cancer Center was on Ninth Avenue, working with Pat Walsh and Mike Glodet. And they said, you know, this is really interesting. This is really intriguing. We should go to the FDA with this. So uh, we took the data package we had. And it was really entirely based on the dog studies. Um, there was a biotech company that picked up the technology, presented the data package to the FDA, and they green lighted the study really within about six months of seeing the dog data. So this was the first um, gene therapy trial at the CU Cancer Center back in the late 90s. So it was really, a, a, I guess, fortuitous in a sense that it worked as well as it did, but it was able, we were able to move very efficiently from the dog model into human trials. So um, fast forward to today, our work since then has really begun to focus more on the um, targeting the tumor microenvironment. And, and our focus has been on the myeloid component of that TME, particularly the monocyte and macrophage component. And so we've gone through several iterations of, of various ways to target that myeloid cell compartment using um, different immunotherapy approaches. And I'm just kind of walk you through it here somewhat in chronological order. So we first looked at macrophage depletion as a strategy, and we used a drug called liposomal clodronate. So if you put a bisphosphonate in liposomes and make them about the right size, it will selectively wipe out most tissue macrophages, um, <clears throat> including macrophages in the tumor. So we evaluated this approach in dogs with soft tissue sarcoma, showed that indeed it could deplete macrophages, um, didn't really cause tumor regression. We had some dogs that developed stable disease, but it was, it was really kind of our first proof of concept that we could scale from mice to dogs in a, in a, in a way that made sense with the available reagents that we had. But the, the more important work has been done when we've switched targets. The liposomal clodronate had some toxicity issues, so we changed gears, we said, well, maybe can't deplete the cells outright, maybe we'll just stop them from accumulating. So if you block monocyte migration, if you continue that blockade for several weeks, eventually you'll deplete the tumor of macrophages because it needs to be replenished from the bloodstream. And so we looked for drugs that could accomplish this. There are pure CCR2 antagonists they do work in vitro in dogs, but they're far too expensive to use in a clinical trial setting. So we, um, we did a series of in silico modeling studies to find other drugs. And we were particularly interested in already approved, FDA approved drugs with a good safety record. And <clears throat> from that screen, we identified angiotensin receptor blocking drugs as having this off target effect on CCR2. And that's really been the basis of a platform technology that we've built. And that was evaluated in dogs with osteosarcoma and, and in dogs with glioma. And those studies are ongoing and we'll look at those studies shortly. Um, 
More recently, we've also looked at strategies to block the mobilization of myeloid-derived suppressor cells, either block their mobilization and or, or induce differentiation. And so the class of drugs that have come out of those studies, and this is a collaboration with Betsy Rapaski at, at Roswell Park, has been um, beta adrenergic blockers, another you know, totally unrelated class of drugs used to treat um, uh, cardiac disease that also has this off-target immunological effect. And um, we're looking at that class of drugs um, in dogs with also osteosarcoma as well as glioma. And then in a new tumor, or I guess not new, not new for dogs, but I think what we're starting to recognize could be a very valuable new animal cancer model, which is cyanonasal carcinoma in dogs. It's not a common human tumor, but it's common enough, and we see a lot of it in dogs. So we're going to be evaluating the beta adrenergic blockade strategy in dogs with this tumor shortly with care of us. And then the other way we're modulating the tumor microenvironment is to deplete regulatory T cells. Um, this, it was recognized several years ago that non-specific tyrosine kinase inhibitors, such as tocirinib, which is the canine equivalent of sunitinib, that they do deplete regulatory T cells. They also deplete myeloid-derived suppressor cells. <clears throat> and then we're developing an OX40 biologic as well, which also depletes t -reg. So those are being evaluated in, uh, also in osteo as well as melanoma and squamous cell carcinoma. And we'll look at some of that data. Uh, let's see if I can get this to advance. Okay, so, um, and I should call out Dan Regan. So Dan's on the call and, and really Dan pioneered a lot of this work in my lab uh, back when he was completing his graduate study. So we identified the ARBs as a class of drugs that had this off-target CCR2 antagonistic property. And Dan really proved or, you know, really drilled down and, and looked at Lestartan as a member of the class, showed that it blocked monocyte migration at really easily achievable serum concentrations, showed in a mouse model that it blocked monocyte migration in response to inflammation. It was actually almost as potent as a complete knockout of CCR2. And then Dan went on to evaluate Lasartan in, in mouse models. And I should point out that Lasartan had been looked at by Rakesh Jain's group already for its anti-tumor activity, but they were looking at a different mechanism of activity. And I think in retrospect, the CCR2 effect could explain a lot of what other groups have seen with Lasartan. Um, and I think it's important by understanding the mechanism, we can also predict how to use the drug more effectively. So we looked at Lasartan alone, and it did have some anti-tumor activity. But when we combined it with a multifunction TKI, sunitinib, we um, realized that the activity was significantly improved. So if you look at the bottom right-hand panel, the green group is the group treated with a combination of Lasartan and sunitinib. So that combination really looked promising in this mouse model. So we stepped back, took that information, said, well, maybe we should look at this combination in dogs with osteosarcoma. So um, we designed a series of studies. And what I'm showing is going to be the combined efforts from about four years of research, looking at the sartan um, in combination with tocirinib, which is um, known as palladian dogs as immunotherapy. So I should also point out that tocirinib had been shown by several other groups in dogs with metastatic osteosarcoma to the lungs to have no activity. So it, it has no direct anti-tumor activity. But in the case we were using it as immunotherapy, we were in a sense repurposing it as an immune therapy drug rather than as a targeted agent. So we looked at the combination in dogs and we learned some hard lessons along the way, which is don't always trust published data for dosing for these drugs in dogs. So we 
we learned that the sartan had to be dosed at a much higher dose to achieve an anti-tumor effect and to block monocyte migration than the published dose for treating hypertension in dogs. Um, and I should also point out this paper is coming out next week. And, and it's really, I mean, Dan has done an amazing job with this paper. It's a really good read if you get a chance to look at it. But um, what we found was that the high dose Losartan in combination with Tocerinib given continuously, both drugs are orally available, given continuously does exert a, a significant anti-tumor effect. And that data is summarized here. Um, Doug Tham had published previously that Tocerinib alone in the setting of metastatic osteo had essentially zero activity. Um, so we, we knew that if we saw something with the combination, it wasn't coming from tocirinib by itself. We also knew that low dose Losartan, that the previous, in retrospect, wrong dose, really had very little activity either. But at the proper dose, at the 10 mg per kg dose, that combination started to show significant activity. So about a 30% partial response rate and an overall biologic response rate of 50%. In, in the setting of a disease in, in veterinary oncology that has been essentially refractory to any treatment. By the time dogs undergo amputation, go through cytotoxic adjuvant chemotherapy, and then um, relapse and develop uh, metastatic disease, they essentially have two to three months to live and there's really nothing is active. So this, this activity we're seeing is actually really important in that context. Um, this, and I should say this work is advancing. It's being funded by this Moonshot Initiative, the U01 program. We've added a third drug into the cocktail, another drug targeting a different chemokine receptor pathway. And that three drug combination looks um, even more active. So um, I, you know, I think this platform is a good platform because it's also lends itself well to other immunotherapy approaches. And then um, I, I wanted to point out also that the work that Dan and the group here at the Animal Cancer Center, Center did in the dog osteo model with the Sartan to serenip combination led really directly to a trial that's underway now at Children's um, led by uh, Kerry Cost and Kelly Fock, looking at the SART in combination with Sinidinib um, for pediatric relapsed osteosarcoma patients. And um, that study is currently enrolling, uh, they're also enrolling at um, Emory. We're still at the first cohort at the lowest dose of Losartan. Um, so, again, if we look at by analogy to the dog study, we probably would not expect to see much activity until we get to the second or third cohort of Lassard dosing. Um, but it's it's been a very um, rewarding study in the sense that we've been able to see sort of the fruits of our efforts moving directly into kids you know, in a pretty efficient timeline. And this study is also being supported by the Animal Cancer Center, which is kind of a, a twist on things. So the it's been a very nice collaboration with the group at Children's and um, we're anxiously awaiting um, the results of the next dosing cohorts. But we, so we've kind of used that Losartan to Serenib platform to move into other tumor models. Um, so we're looking also in the canine glioma model. And this is work that Rebecca Packer did <clears throat> While well, she was on faculty here, uh, Dylan Ammons in my lab is writing up the studies now, and Stephanie McGrath, who I saw on the call, will be taking over these studies here shortly. But it was the idea here is we would take this myeloid cell depletion platform and now combine it with a tumor lysate vaccine in the dog glioma model. And here's an example on the left of a typical. A tumor, a typical glioma in a canine patient. They typically arise in the prefrontal cortex. They are um, locally invasive. Um, they respond not at all to cytotoxic chemotherapy. Then they can be debulked, rarely if ever cured surgically. 
it, there is some responsiveness to radiation. The trial we're showing you the data from here is only with um, combination immunotherapy. There's no surgery, no radiation, no temozolomide. So we're so we're actually seeing about a forty percent response rate in dogs with a with these you know rap, fairly quickly progressing tumors um, that really are otherwise refractory to most treatment, responding simply to modifying the tumor microenvironment, combining it with a strategy, a vaccine, and to uh, also bring in a T cell response to, against the tumor. And again, this platform needs to be combined and it's going to be combined next with radiation. And in fact, <clears throat> we've already treated three patients with the combination immuno vaccine radiation and, and probably have cured one dog and the other two are long-term survivors. So we're very excited about this work. We're hoping to collaborate with Adam Green, move this into the pediatric um, brain cancer platform at, at Children's and, and work with our colleagues there. Um, this is an, a new study. Um, it's just being submitted for publication. Different tumor in dogs. This is oral cancer in dogs. This is a study with Kara Boss, here with Dan, and then um, Santa Karam at, at uh, the Cancer Center at Anschutz. This is an in situ tumor vaccine study using an, a canine OX40 antibody combined with a combined TLR39 agonist. Um, looking at that immunotherapy combined with radiation and looking at its impact on oral cancer in dogs. And this was really a phase one safety study. So the, the design is on the left. So the dogs are diagnosed, um, get a tumor biopsy. They get a series of three to five, three to five SBRT fractions to the tumor. At the last fraction, they get one injection of the immunotherapy. <clears throat> so, the, so the immunotherapy is not repeated. And, and if we were to do a trial to look at efficacy as the endpoint, we would do repeated injections. But single injection, make sure it was safe and look at immune endpoints. And this was six dogs per arm. They were randomized, so 12 dog study. What we, it was super interesting. What we found was that that combination was very effective at depleting regulatory T cells from the tumor microenvironment. I mean, OX40 is known, OX40 antibodies are known to deplete T regs because T regs are critically dependent on OX40 signaling. So we think this is a, an immune, um, this meets an immune target for this particular approach. And we're interested in taking this now and, and moving it into a larger trial. And then uh, one last study, and then uh, we'll wrap up for discussion. But this is new work headed by Jenna Cowan, my lab with Linda Chow's is, um, also assisting. And then a really nice collaboration with Jessica Lake and Mike Verneris at Anschutz. Um, looking at whether we can move Kena and, or move CAR T cell technology to dogs. Um, and again, we don't want to just give CAR T cells to dogs because they've been given to humans. We really want to see if we can leverage the dog model to do something different. So we're taking B7H3 targeted CAR T cells, um, human osteosarcoma samples, by and large, all overexpress B7H3. It's, a, it's actually a checkpoint molecule, but also a really good target for CAR T cells, very low levels of expression on normal tissues. Um, this um, work is just getting underway, but we're gonna combine the CAR T cell approach with, again, back to our platform technology of modifying the TME by depletion of myeloid cells. And, Jenna's uh, screened our canine osteocell lines to show that they essentially all express B7H3. Um, she's also screened glioma cell lines and they're also B7H3 positive. She's made canine B7H3 CAR T cells using a construct provided by the Verneris lab. Uh, so it's a human targeting construct, but the data suggests that that construct also recognizes canine B7H3 
in the um, panel of, of osteosarcoma cell lines, we can show a recognition by both cytokine induction by the CAR T cells, as well as by actual tumor cytotoxicity. So um, where we are now is we're gonna move these CAR T cells into a mouse um, a xenograft model to see if the CAR, canine CAR T cells will kill canine osteo cells in an immune deficient mouse. And then the next studies would move into um, dogs with metastatic osteo. And then finally, I'll just kind of throw this out there because it's, because it's a super intriguing study. This is this universal vaccine for cancer prevention. And Rod may mention this also in his upcoming um, discussion this afternoon, but this is the VAXTRA. The, this is the um, vaccine against canine cancer study trial. So um, this is this came out of Stephen Johnson's lab at the University of Arizona. That guy comes up with some crazy ideas, but most of them end up working. So what he proposed is that there are most or all cancers um, will produce these common frame shift mutations with lead, which lead to neoantigen production. And he's got a technology to screen for recognition of these neoantigens. And he identified the most common, I think it's, um, I believe it's nine different frame shift mutations, built a pool of peptides that covered those mutations and got funding to do an 800 dog randomized trial where the dogs are vaxxed. These are dogs without cancer. So this is cancer prevention. Dogs without cancer get randomized to either vaccine or placebo. It's enrolling multiple breeds. They all have to be cancer prone breeds. You have to be middle-aged dogs. So we don't want puppies. We don't want dogs that are so old that they die of something else. So six to 10 years of age, I'm still enrolling if you have a six to 10 year old dog of the right breed, um, you should see about getting your dog enrolled. Um, and the primary endpoint is time to cancer development. So the whole goal is to prevent cancer from developing in these dogs. And it's a multi-center study um, here at CSU. It's been um, directed by Dr. Tham and Vail at University of Wisconsin and Rob Bune at University of California, Davis. So, this will be very interesting to see how this trial plays out. And I, so I think I'll stop there, just kind of, kind of summarize key points. You know, dogs as a model for immuno-oncology research. I would argue they recapitulate most of the immune responses we see in human cancer. Again, I really want to stress the importance of immune education over time is really a key a, you know, a key um, discriminator of the dog model versus the mouse model. Our new tools are closing the gap immunologically. You know, I don't think we really have much to apologize for anymore. And then, you know, I think we've shown with the mouse to dog to pediatric osteo trial, really in the space of five years, how the dog really fits into this strategy of speeding translation. And uh, these are the acknowledgements. Um, people in our group at the Cancer Center, folks we're collaborating with at the Anschutz campus. And you guys probably don't know Karen Christopher or Alan Palestine, but I did want to give a shout out to them. Uh, they're actually ophthalmologists, and we're collaborating with them on a really interesting horse model of ocular surface neoplasia. So there are other models here at the cancer center, animal cancer center, in addition to dogs. And I, Dan, I'll go ahead and pose a question. And you know, I, I think really what we as a group really want to achieve is <clears throat> how can we leverage the dog model in new ways? We don't want to just recapitulate what's already been done. For example, you know, given dogs, PD-1 immunotherapy doesn't really advance the field, but what can we do with dogs that's really creative to advance the, uh, you know, the whole IO research endeavor? And so I think that's where we'll, we'll leave it for discussion. Yeah, thanks, Steve. I mean, I, you know, your, your question, what it, 
re reminded me of what the slide you showed that talked about, you know, hot and cold tumors. I mean, I think one thing in the dog is how do we make, you know, cold tumors, hot tumors. I mean, <laughs> that's been, I mean, I think th that's where, you know, at least to me, that's, I think where um, things could, could be really interesting. If, if the discussion lags, I did have a couple of proposals, but we'll, we'll see if we can get some input. Hey, Steve, this is Anne. I just had one, um, one area where we are behind. Um, I agree with all um, what you said about our resources, but um, T cell receptor profiling, I think, is a resource that we would need to follow the immune system. And that's something that just really hasn't yet been developed in the dogs. Fair yeah, fair, fair enough. And, and antigen presentation, all of the algorithms we don't have either. Yeah, like you mean like um, peptide prediction and things like right, that. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, so neoantigen vaccines would not really be our strength. I think I think that there's a lot of a lot of places to go in terms of of combination therapies that you know might be slower in development and in humans with regards to um, immune therapy and and chemo and surgical approaches and you know I mean I, I especially think in the you know in the adjuvant setting where it maybe you know may take a long time and in humans to get to get some answers with regards to immune approaches. Yeah, for sure. And, and I, you know, I, we've begun to really think a lot more about radiation therapy. And I think, you know, that's some, that's an area where certainly the dog model, I think can be really utilized effectively um, just because we have more opportunities to irradiate dogs in different ways and with different combinations. So we're not quite so fixed as some of the protocol driven human um, studies. Yeah. I mean, I, I was just thinking, you know, the, uh, there's a lot of, you know, um, uh, interest in, you know, adjuvant therapy with immuno oncology and that's stuff that you're probably not going to see for a while on the human side, unless I've missed something. Um, you know, it's more used for for bulky bulky disease or for for known disease, um, but you know you could do the head to head trial with, you know, um, immune therapy versus you know, um, chemo and osteo or something like that. If you if you knew you could, you know, make make those tumors immune responsive or at least worked on that side. I mean, that's that's to me where I think it would be very compelling. Yeah, I mean, for sure, there's an opportunity there. I mean, that this is a space that's probably been the most explored in the last, certainly the last five years in comparative oncology. Um, and I, I think that that is uh, clear from the, the collaborations you have, Steve, and the fact you've got, you've, you've been able to, I mean, that that's, you know, kind of where a lot of a lot of the translational medicine is gone, but I, you know, I think it, it can go deeper, certainly in terms of comprehensive treatments, radiation, surgery, adjuvant, you know, other, other type things. Um, and, and where we haven't necessarily jumped at immune therapies in um, in human cancer and, you know, certainly with, with solid tumors and in, in trying to break in with some of the cell-based therapies with those, we can get an idea of how those work better, I think. So, you know, I think this kind of ties into nicely, you know, following Don's presentation where maybe starting to also understand how some of these molecular drivers might stratify differences in the immune microenvironment of these tumors and potentially, you know, changes in or, you know, immediate responses to these therapies as well. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the genetics and diversity of, you know, immune responses is, is I mean, that's true, right? I mean, we, we can study that easier 
I don't know how, how well, but in cell line models, when you just look at drug response, but immune response, you need the, you need this intact system, right? Which makes it harder um, to, to study those, the potential differences in the um, various genetic diversity associated with the tumors. Um, Polygenic has a question in the chat. Are there canine models of childhood blood or other cancers other than osteo uh, amenable to pediatric cancer vaccine development? What do you, what do you think about that, Steve? Um, you know, and Anne can address this also, but we just we just don't see that many blood cancers in dogs. They're, for whatever reason, they're relatively uncommon. Leukemias, AMLs, Dogs are fortunately blessed with not having many of those. Yeah, I mean, the, certainly AML, which is complex and there's many different forms. One of the forms that, that the dogs or what dogs get may be equivalent to some of the pediatric ones. Um, that's something that we're trying to look at right now. Um, but dogs don't get child, um, the same thing as acute lymphoblastic leukemia B cell that um, children gets. So it's more uh, adult versions. Yeah, I mean, certainly there's other sarcomas that um, I'm sure people are looking at for for vaccines that might be applicable to pediatrics, but. All right. Well, again, you know, as, as, as I've said, anything that pops up again, this is start to, you know, we're trying to get the juices flowing. So I'm sure um, Dr. Dow, Dr. Avery um, would be um, very uh, responsive to any questions that you sent them, any, any queries. Um, and, you know, if you send anything to me, I will send it to the, I will send it around to Dr. Regan, Avery, Dow, or some of the other immunocompetent people around here, so to speak. So <laughs> the, um, to look at. All right. Um, so thanks, Steve. That was great. Um, let's move on. Our, our last speaker of this symposium is our Cancer Center Director, Dr. Rod Page. And so, Dr. Page. All right. I just wanted to comment that it looks like um, we have a couple of immunoeducated on oncologists that just spoke. I love that word. <clears throat> okay, we seeing everything okay? Yep. Right. Well, thanks, uh, Dan, and uh, for putting this all together. Um, I wanted to kind of um, wrap up this uh, this conversation with a first this sort of a high level uh, idea about a roadmap for comparative oncology and then move into uh, more uh, prevention and detection opportunities. So this is just a, um, a table with some um, ideas that have been developed over some time about uh, where we are with uh, trying to uh, implement a, a comparative cancer research platform. Uh, so starting from the bottom, it's basically uh, thinking about what sorts of knowledge base do we need um, in terms of basic science that ends up with uh, cancer, genetic profiling, immune characterization, all the things that we've been talking about. But, you know, not overlooking the, uh, the engineering uh, prototypes as well and um, imaging technology that will be able to help us uh, identify some pretty amazing uh, in vivo uh, processes, functional processes in the near future. Um, then moving up to uh, the toolbox, we've talked a lot about what the toolboxes are for our studies uh, related to um, genetics and uh, immuno-oncology. And then um, above that are some of the core resources in terms of um, the types of PKPD imaging, uh, immune monitoring, um, looking at, you know, the, uh, the right-hand side of this uh, table, essentially the goal would be to, uh, from the bottom again, have industry breakthroughs that are compelling and advance the, uh, advance the infrastructure to have a comparable understanding of cancer in comparative uh, terms that exists across species. 
uh, would need to be able to have a rapid translation for us to be able to uh, take advantage of what we've got in the numbers of animals and the numbers of patients and the nature of the, uh, the lifespan and, and uh, tumor growth. Uh, we really need to make sure that we can deploy this uh, rapidly. We need to make sure that there are, uh, there's access to these services and data in an open fashion. Uh, clinical trials and, uh, and, and app applications related to therapeutics uh, we are seeing an increasing number of trials. Um, uh, what we're losing or what we're lacking right now is really a proven business case. Um, there's some models, there's some uh, case studies that have shown that by uh, studying companion animals, we can save money and save time. But so far, it's not necessarily uh, changed, uh, changed the market. Uh, but these need to be high translational values. And then at the very top is uh, prevention, detection, uh, where we are trying to look at this intersection between aging environment and cancer susceptibility uh, in order to help um, characterize risk factors in an extremely detailed and rigorous fashion. Uh, let's see. So um, just to be able to uh, put this into uh, sort of the background uh, stages that uh, we've been talking about in general. Um, there are about 80 million dogs in the US um, and over the last 10 to 20 years, there's been a dramatic increase, uh, 30, 40 years in lifespan, uh, predominantly due to diet, uh, numbers of vaccines that have eliminated really lethal diseases and the advanced medical care. And currently the veterinary medical uh, component of uh, of animal care is um, expanded and is quite sophisticated. So uh, the resources are there to be able to care for dogs as they age. Um, and we know that there is a wide variety in body size, almost a 20 fold difference in body size, but a, um, a difference in lifespan that occurs between small and large dogs of almost uh, two, two fold. Um, but nonetheless, it's still five to 10 times less than the human lifespan. So we need to, and we have uh, taken advantage of, this, uh, of, the, of the math uh, that's demonstrated here to demonstrate that we, we have an opportunity uh, to think about um, the nature of the studies that we can conduct that might allow us to help identify prevention strategies um, and for um, early identification of cancer. So we know that some breeds have a higher risk of cancer. Um, and we also know from some studies looking at um, dogs uh, from a perspective of a, a breeder's perspective that a higher coefficient of inbreeding or essentially having um, line breeding uh, increases the risk of number of different conditions and increases um, increases um, the, the rate of aging and uh, decreases lifespan. So um, these, are, these are things that uh, perhaps are uh, more accentuated in the canine species and particularly across breeds, but um, it is also um, something that we need to consider as, as sort of background or foundation for what we are thinking about in terms of uh, comparative work. So I just want to touch on a few of the uh, projects that are currently um, ongoing and looking at this concept of um, comparative cancer uh, prevention and control. So uh, thanks, Steve, for mentioning the VAX trial. I actually uh, modified my slides as you were speaking, so I don't, I'm not going to spend too much time. You covered that very well, but it is such a unique opportunity, and I don't think that there's any way this could have uh, happened other than um, going through this, this um, multi-center trial. And over the course of you know, five to six to seven years, we should be able to determine if the strategy is really going to work in, in other species. But I'd like to start with the Golden Retriever study. Uh, it's funded by the Morris Animal Foundation. I'll just mention a couple of, um, a couple of words about the Dog Aging Project, which is a very large um, project at the University of Washington and Texas A&M funded by the National Institutes of Aging. 
um, and, and their goal is to um, enroll uh, 10,000 dogs, um, middle age to well uh, all ages, but focusing mainly on middle age, and following uh, them in the same way that the Golden Retriever study has has um, evolved. And lastly, to say a few words about an upcoming workshop at the National Academy of, of Science. Uh, this is a uh, just a, a graph from uh, Daniel Promislau, who is the PI of the uh, dog aging project. Um, and what it shows is some interesting differences and similarities between um, how people and dogs um, die. Um, so essentially we've got um, uh, dogs in blue and people in red and uh, age that is, um, that is um, registered uh, across both species so that we've got very old dogs in blue on this uh, y-axis at the right here. So in terms of congenital death, uh, very similar, very young uh, individuals that die, toxic deaths, very, very um, low frequency. Uh, traumatic deaths uh, in people, I have a suspicion predominantly, uh, you know, um, young people, uh, 15, uh, 10 to 15 to 25 that are in um, a variety of different um, situations where they are in harm's way. Um, and much more dramatically in, in humans and in dogs. Uh, we've got infectious deaths, uh, metabolic deaths, and then uh, neoplastic deaths. And this is uh, quite, uh, quite interesting that there is such a similar uh, range and a similar distribution of both dog and human uh, data that correlates with the death due to cancer. Um, then of course, in, in humans, vascular death, is um, in quite dramatically increasing in older years, but it's uh, pretty much non-existent in dogs. So that gives us uh, some hope that there's uh, a way to work across species to uh, identify reasons why there are um, high rates of death related to cancer as we age. Um, and this is, um, one of the reasons uh, that the Golden Retriever Lifetime Study was, uh, was started about uh, 12 to 13 years ago. At the time, it was the largest prospective study uh, conducted in dogs, observational study. It's not an interventional study. We just, it was built to acquire information and samples um, and to collect outcomes that would be um, remarkable for the ability to connect those outcomes with a story for each of the dogs that was enrolled in this project. And so it was based on the fact that in golden retrievers, there's a suspected high risk of cancer um, and cancer mortality uh, that we wanted to investigate in terms of overall um, issues related to um, incidence and frequency, it was actually powered, the study was powered to determine the incidence of uh, the four most common types of cancers that account for about 80% of the cancer mortality in golden retrievers, but also to then uh, work um, both backwards and forwards to look at prevention strategies and to create hypotheses for future testing. Uh, so um, we hope that we'd be able to create um, the resources to develop biomarkers and interventional hypotheses based on um, aspects of the, of the collective data. So in addition to cancer, we collect every major disease and disorder uh, that Goldens or any dog would uh, be, be accustomed to getting. Uh, this is where the dogs uh, live across the country. Um, it's population centric, as you can see, as you would expect. Um, we have dogs in all 48 states that are, uh, you know, the lower 48, and uh, California, and then uh, New England, Florida, Texas has quite a few. But I want to just point out Colorado uh, has, um, on a per capita basis, has an order of magnitude more golden retrievers than any other state in the country, which. Um, uh, surprised me. So most of them live in a suburban environment, but there are uh, distributions of um, rural and urban. We have about, we entered, we enrolled 3,000 dogs over the course of um, about two to three years. 
uh, based on projections that at the time of um, the endpoint uh, analysis, we would need about 1,800 dogs to have survived to a point of about 10 to 12 years in order to um, accurately estimate the incidence of these cancers. Uh, and we, we collect a lot of data. Um, this is a screenshot of the um, online questionnaire that is conducted uh, every year by the uh, owner of every dog that has been enrolled. Um, and it includes, as you can see, a tremendous number of pages of question after question. Um, and this, it's, it's um, you know, it's a typical online questionnaire. There's a lot of skip functions. If you have a, a dog that's uh, female, you're not gonna answer male questions and go into sire and dam history. The reproductive history is extremely, um, extremely uh, lengthy uh, for reasons related to not only uh, the nature of the, of the timing uh, of uh, spay neuter, which is an important uh, uh, descriptor of future, um, future conditions, but also for purposes of perhaps looking at um, environmental um, pseudoestrogen uh, effects on um, on bitches that are in uh, the breeding program, and whether or not there are things related to this. I mentioned the uh, uh, inbreeding, the coefficient of inbreeding that might uh, relate to some environmental exposures. Uh, we've already had, in terms of uh, litter mates, uh, we've already you know we've got a lot of information. We have lots of litters that are uh, total litters that are enrolled and we've actually had over well over a thousand dogs born to the dogs that were uh, originally enrolled. Uh, physical activity, co uh, the uh, every over-the-counter medicine, dental hygiene, diet, feeding practices are quite extensive, um, environmental and living conditions, and uh, actually a behavior questionnaire and a uh, cognitive function uh, component now to look at um, the effects as these dogs are reaching um, into older age groups. Every year we collect um, blood, urine, uh, feces, hair, toenails, and when there's a tumor we connect, we collect the, um, the tumor tissue uh, for histopathologic analysis and also uh, uh, tumor into um, into solutions for evaluations of, uh, of the genetic components of the, of the tumor. We also collect um, nearby normal tissue. Um, so there's an annual examination, clinical labs for every dog, uh, looking at um, their, uh, their general, um, their general uh, evaluations and uh, all of the um, connections through the veterinarians. We developed a, an uh, electronic medical record specifically for this study that uh, captures most of the information we want, uh, including some graphic um, graphic ways of looking at dermal uh, tumor, dermal masses. And we're in the process now of putting a lot of this stuff um, into a variety of pipelines. And um, I was asking Don earlier about the ICDC, and I, I believe there will be a desire and a, and a willingness to put all of the information from the uh, golden retriever study into that database, which will be um, a fairly substantial um, amounts of, of uh, genetic data. We will be uh, doing fairly uh, detailed high, high density sequencing for all 3000 dogs, uh, thanks to the V Foundation as well as all of the tumors that are uh, available for us to be able to sequence on this, on this uh, cohort as well. So as of June of this year, this is where we currently stand. The, um, we enrolled 3,040 dogs, uh, 2,220, 51 dogs now are, are alive. Um, it included 2,700 owners, 2,000 veterinarians across the country, and a volunteer force of 400 people that uh, help all of these owners and dogs make it to their appointments, um, help them through difficult times and uh, create all kinds of social platforms for celebration of each of the dogs which have their own um, hero number in this, in this study. Uh, the median age of the cohort now is eight and a half years. 
Uh, there's been over a million biological samples that are held at the Fisher Biorepository in, um, in Maryland. Um, we've had 352 dogs die and 66% of those are uh, due to cancer. So it's as a, you know, we're only uh, now uh, less than 10 years into it, uh, the median age of eight and a half, you can see the survival curve or the actuarial survival curve over on the right. Um, so we're not even at the point where we've um, lost 50%. We've only lost really, you know, uh, looks like 20 20% 20 of the dogs, 30% of the dogs to age. Some have um, withdrawn. Uh, we're about 80%, 85% full compliance at 10 years, which is pretty significant, um, pretty phenomenal for uh, a large group of, um, of patients, whether human or canine and speaks to the uh, dedication and devotion of the owners um, in this particular study. And notably, 66% um, of the dogs have gone through an autopsy or an, uh, or an necropsy. Uh, so uh, we have a lot, of, a lot of information and a lot of data waiting for everyone to use as they see fit and to answer, ask and answer questions. Um, uh, the, four and now five uh, primary endpoints are listed here in terms of the numbers, uh, about half of these, about 240 primary endpoints uh, so far, half of them are hemangiosarcomas, um, 86 lymphomas, um, high-grade mast cell tumors and osteos are not nearly as common as I thought they would be. Um, and then we noticed and should have predicted that there would be an increase in uh, the number of, or at least uh, identify that histiocytic sarcoma should be listed as a primary endpoint. Um, and actually in the last uh, two or three months, we've had a, a run of histiocytic sarcomas so that the, the data is actually more robust there. So there's a lot of, um, a lot of demographic and epidemiologic information that um, is being accumulated rapidly now as the uh, survival curve starts to trend downward. Uh, but realize that, um, you know, as I mentioned, we've only lost um, a fraction of, of the dogs. And so probably the majority of data is yet to come. So um, in terms of translational opportunities, we've got um, exposure outcome predictions. Um, how, you know, is there a relationship to nature of the type of water the dog drinks, not necessarily from municipal toilets, but um, you know, uh, wells, well uh, water uh, around the country has significant uh, variation in contaminants um, and uh, a variety of exposures to other environmental chemicals, both uh, external and internal. Uh, we've got 33% um, of the dogs are overweight. Uh, we don't have a BMI measurement in dogs, but we have this body condition score, which is, uh, accomplished by the veterinarians at every visit. 4% are obese. Um, so there are uh, very interesting issues about the role of obesity in a variety, in all conditions, essentially. We've yet to really tackle the diet uh, component of this project, yet it's, um, it's phenomenal how many uh, different diets there are and what types of things are added to the diets. Uh, the type of lifestyle, some of these dogs are extreme or elite athletes. Um, hunting dogs, dogs that just run with their elite owners, um, the environment they live in, where they travel, uh, what kind of water they swim in, um, the air that they breathe, uh, the nature of the, um, of the type of things that they get, um, get um, involved with are pretty, pretty interesting to follow. Uh, so there's been a number of talks about the possibility of doing a parallel human study with, with owners. We, um, we almost started one with, uh, with the group at the University of Washington at the beginning, but weren't able to get all of the um, HIPAA requirements um, uh, organized. But um, you know, obviously there's now, besides just the uh, pandemic, there's a tremendous amount of information that could be gleaned from uh, following the air quality, both indoor and outdoor air quality. Uh, as it relates to respiratory disease and influence of other uh, functions within the body. 
Uh, we've also started this uh, Golden Oldies project, which is a, cent uh, a centenarian study uh, compared to people of, that reach 100 years of age. But we've identified uh, about 100, uh, 200 dogs that are 12 years of age or older that have not had cancer. Uh, and we have their, their DNA uh, waiting to be sequenced as well. So I want to just um, finish up um, and we can talk about other opportunities with uh, the idea that um, it would be, um, there's a lot of things that we would uh, need in order to fulfill the idea about comparative uh, cancer control and prevention in companion animals as a sentinel for humans. And this is now a subject of a workshop that will be held uh, December one through three. And uh, it's focused on um, environmental exposures, aging and cancer susceptibility in companion animals as a, um, as a way to help predict and mitigate issues in humans. So I've um, been working on this for quite a while, a couple of years actually have tremendous uh, support from a number of different um, institutions, the NIA, uh, NCI, the NIEHS, and the EPA have all financially uh, helped to support this project. The uh, University of uh, Colorado Cancer Center uh, is a uh, sponsor, CSU is a sponsor, a number of other uh, animal health foundations are sponsors, and uh, James DeGregori is gonna be talking about cancer and aging at this um, at this uh, symposium this workshop <clears throat> but the real the real um, hope is that there are so many gaps in terms of what data sources are needed how do we build uh, cross-platform cross-species um, information can we um, identify certain uh, ways to localize the exposures through gis mapping um, that will correlate with human exposures or what we know about agricultural uh, exposures to groundwater, uh, heavy metals, um, all kinds of other types of things, and, and then um, try to put those together. Um, what uh, biosensors can we develop? Um, where do we put and what type of samples are we going to hope to acquire? And are there special connect, um, collections that need to be housed in particularly um, important ways? Um, this health record data, how do we put those together between uh, you know, in human individuals and canine individuals? And um, then there's a, a real issue, real, lots of interesting issues about policy um, and ethics. Um, one thing that I wasn't um, really predicting is a strong interest and um, almost a, a requirement to look at environmental justice issues. Uh, that being that um, the exposures to harmful chemicals is most uh, prevalent in under, um, underrepresented and underserved communities and is the potential for um, helping to manage or take care of the companion animals for those individuals, a way to get, gather information in a, in a trustworthy and a culturally sensor, sensitive uh, method. So we actually have folks from a number of um, Native American reservations and low socioeconomic uh, area uh, regions, areas that were hit by uh, hurricanes and floods and fires and, you know, really things that are uh, pretty, pretty remarkable, pretty interesting. Um, so I think um, the, there's the, there's the extremely long website that I couldn't uh, pare down to anything else. Um, feel free to email me if you're interested or uh, you can uh, search for this on the National Academy's website. But uh, this, this paper was um, published about the same time we got approval to do the workshop, um, which is a project done by a group at Duke and uh, Matthew Breen to uh, show that there's a, a correlation between the exposures that humans have 
and their pets have using these uh, silicone uh, detection um, bracelets and collars or, or um, um, tags. And that uh, throughout a uh, range of maybe 15 to 20 different chemicals that were evaluated with um, these, um, these types of uh, silicone uh, detectors, the correlations were remarkably similar. So um, it is likely that there will be um, some interesting uh, findings in areas related to um, high uh, contamination if we are able to use the companion animal as a way to screen and potentially mitigate some of these uh, some of these issues. So um, I'm going to stop there and um, stop sharing and uh, see if there are any any interesting comments or things that come up that we can pursue a little bit uh, bit more in depth. So thank you, thank you, Dan. Awesome, thanks, Rod. Let's open this up to uh, questions. Our like James, got James got a question. Dr. Yeah. Gregory. Hey, Rod. I greatly look forward to that workshop. It'll be great. Um, so, so I think it was the, the golden retriever study. You guys are doing RNA seq, and I presume that's on. Is that on mononuclear cells from peripheral blood? Uh, we're not doing RNA seq. We're we're doing. Uh, we collect um, RNA later um, samples, but um, we are doing uh, just regular DNA. Uh, sequencing. Ah, so you're just doing so. So no plans to do the RNA seq right now, okay? Because no. that would. Are you doing anything that's going to monitor inflammatory markers? Well, um, so when um, we we collect we collect this information and uh, leave it up to you to decide what you want to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, we'll and, be in touch. <laughs> yeah. Um, so some of it will be will be determined by whether or not we have collected the right samples for you uh, in the right way. And if they are, um, um, if they're still the right uh, type of uh, sample once they get into the biorepository. These are not, these are taken by uh, practicing general, general practitioners. So they're not snap frozen. They're not processed in, in any other way other than, um, you know, separation of the serum and the whole blood. Um, so there'll be some limitations to what you can do, but we've already had some uh, preliminary work done for um, purposes of uh, metabolomics and other uh, forms of omics to show that the samples are actually in, in pretty good shape within 48 hours for some, some things we're gonna lose uh, obviously, but um, other questions can be asked um, that uh, will relate to the nature of the samples that we have. Yeah. RNA later should be quite good. I mean, it's very yeah. good at preserving the sample, so it should be good. Yeah. Yeah. Steve Dow said these samples would work for the new nanostring I/O panel. Yeah, that would be that would be pretty cool to look at the. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the uh, the team at uh, uh, Morris is. Um, They've gone through uh, a lot of different uh, permutations to, to get the study um, organized and managed, and uh, really have to give them a lot of uh, a lot of respect for taking this leap of um, of faith. That you know, up until this point, there'd never been a study like this, a cradle to grave um, type of a uh, project, and um, have uh, an outstanding scientific steering committee that has helped answer questions about uh, what samples we would like to collect, which, how do we modify those now that we have more uh, interest in certain things like um, James was mentioning, or um, how to perhaps modify our sampling technique to make sure that we have the right, um, the right types of uh, samples for doing what needs to be done now. So it's, um, yeah, it's been, it's been a great ride. Hey Rod, is there any plans to do this in any other breeds or or mixed breeds or anything like that? that well, I think um, so. The dog aging project is is a mixed breed um, all comers sort of a uh, project. Uh, we did have a conversation about whether there would be interest in uh, Scottish Terriers. Uh, 
So I think it, it'll be a matter of um, funding to do this. Uh, and you know, in if I if I had it to do over again, I'm not sure I would have started off with uh, enrolling uh, young dogs, really young dogs. It just is um, extremely expensive. So if you're looking at cancer endpoints, um, the dog aging project is probably doing it a little bit uh, more economically, but you know it's still it's still a twenty million plus study. Are they are they doing any breed analysis like Mars test or anything on all those yeah. dogs or they are? Yeah, yep, they are. Uh, we did a we did all of ours too. I mean, we had oh. to have dogs that were um, AKC registered or had. Uh, minimum of two generations of uh, pedigree papers to show that they were a purebred golden and we submitted um, Mars wisdom tests on them. And there were quite a few that had uh, somehow been contaminated. <laughs> most of them had, most of them had poodle DNA. I mean, the ones uh. that were named most, most of them were true, you know, hundred percent pure uh, golden, but there were some that had, there's one must've been one poodle hanging around there a long time ago. Yeah, retrieve a doodles, huh? <laughs> <laughs> or no, those are golden doodles, I think is what they call oh, them, right? Yeah. yeah. So so one thing that came out of that pan cancer study from that perspective is that uh, um, uh, Shaying developed a GitHub, uh, well, some code basically that goes through uh, germline variants in different breeds of dogs and identified germline variants that are specific to dogs. And now the code's up there that will help you determine if you're, you know, if the breed has been mis misidentified based on those um, germline variants. So if you have, um, you know, whole exome sequencing or whole genome sequencing and you mm -hmm. want to confirm breed, you can probably put it through that code. Yeah, uh, we are quite interested, in, obviously, in looking at these uh, germline cancer susceptibility mutations, if we can find uh, more than we know about already. Um, but, you know, I think the concept of not only the, um, the environmental issues, but, you know, the social, sociological issues and having, um, having this uh, opportunity to work uh, in, a, uh, in a way that allows us to maybe take some um, take some hypotheses across species over the course of a dog's life and the relationship that the, um, that the person has with the dog uh, could be kind of um, interesting and powerful as well. We haven't really delved into that very much, but you know, the, um, the commitment of these owners is just uh, uh, out of this world. You know, the, we had to rewrite the questionnaire a couple of times because we had too many um, um, free, free form uh, answer opportunities, and we'd end up with uh, you know volumes of daily uh, daily activities for each dog that we couldn't do much with. But you know now there's there's all kinds of ways that we could potentially do um, uh, a lot of AI searching for interesting information uh, that we didn't have access or even dreamt about you know ten years ago. Hey, do, do you know? I mean, it's it's with. With a lot of the cancer corridors we have in people, a lot of it's been attributed to chemical exposure. Are they doing any type of, you know, tissue biopsies to bank to look for exposures potentially? Um, that's one of the things I really pushed for, and unfortunately, it requires um, uh, a short anesthesia, which uh, mm. was already a little bit more than people were willing to do. Uh, but you know, I think there's a, um, you know, there's a portion of the dog aging project. Uh, that will do take fat samples and store those along with all the other uh, all the other uh, types of samples that they'll be um, gathering as well. Yeah, it'll be fascinating if cancer incidents go up in some of these underserved areas like they do in people. That would be like, uh oh. <laughs> yeah, and I think you know the uh, this back study that uh, that Steve and I mentioned. That's essentially a um, Longitudinal cohort study just happens to be an interventional one, but there's samples that would be that are available, and we're actually using some of those for some other studies in metabolomics and and uh, nature. You know those these banks, these banks of uh, samples from 
these longitudinal studies could be um, looked at in all kinds of um, all kinds of platforms, all kinds of ways. Yeah, and that's mix our chocolate labs in that one. So you got Kelly samples in there somewhere. So that's right. good. Yeah. Rob, I just wanted to add that there's also a group of people um, interested in looking at clonal hematopoiesis in these goldens. And so we've, I'm assuming that's maybe what the inflammation question was related to. Um, so we, we're we sort of meeting to try and work out um, what we want to look at and um, uh, how we're going to start that project. So. That, that's a great, this is a great resource for that as well. Yeah. Thanks, Anne. And Anne has been extremely helpful in uh, subtyping the lymphomas uh, through her laboratory for this study. Um, so there's, you know, this is really, I think, the intersection between aging and cancer and environment. Um, and the, and the, the type of people that we have that will be participating in this, um, in this workshop is really, um, really high level. Uh, our the chair of the uh, committee is uh, Linda Birnbaum, who is the retired uh, director of NIEHS and um, retired director of the National Talks Program and has done some work in this area. But uh, with her connections, her network and influence, um, you know, we've been able to acquire uh, really uh, world class experts in uh, areas related to you know, epigenetic aging, uh, metabolomics, um, the nature of, um, you know, exposures in every, in every classification that you can think of, as well as this environmental um, justice concept. So um, feel free, I mean, it's open to the public. Hope you'll uh, register. Uh, it's gonna be, right now, it's gonna be both um, virtual and in-person, um, so you can, you can do whatever you'd like to. There's no cost, uh, and it should be should be quite um, quite interesting. There'll be a report afterwards that will identify a, a path forward with um, funding opportunities or gaps that need filling. I could also mention uh, Melissa Handel, who was just recently hired at um, at Anschutz um, as a data data coordinator, data manager, data something. James, you can probably help me out, but she's, um, she's quite interested in uh, cross-species um, information platforms and um, data, data harmonization. All right. I know we've kind of been talking as we go. Um, you know, I'd open up the the discussion to to any questions anybody has uh the rfp was sent out um with the the link to this i noticed on there i never said where to send them i will send out and <laughs> um I, I'll, I'll probably just have them sent to to me or or to michaela i'll ask her uh what she thinks um you know i i gladly anybody that's you know interested in this um can reach out to me i also put um either either james or, or kathy bradley um some of our uh associate directors of the cancer center but i'm sure any of our speakers dr page um you know let's get the conversation going our our goal is you know like i said to get some some interactions um and uh you know, get some grants in and then get some bigger grants in and, um, you know, start, start science and the, the, the crud out of this stuff. So I think there's a lot of interesting things. Um, I want to thank all of our speakers, uh, Drs. Burton, Dr. Duvall, Dr. Dow, Dr. Page. Thank you. Um, I think that was, that was awesome. Um, and, you know, we have a, we have a, a, a place to leap off from and, and get this going. So, that I open the floor. Any comments, questions, or anything else from anybody? I want to spend some money. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> we, we can, hopefully, we get some really, really nice proposals. I mean, I think you know a lot of us have been thinking about this, and it's a, it's a, you know, a good chance to say, hey, let's, let's, let's jump into this. And so, I was um, thinking after. Um, after listening to Dawn and having her talk about this um, this new paper, 
um, where there were um, you know, essentially pathway alignments between comparative oncology and human oncology, how, how um, important that is to the thought process of um, developing new, uh, new ways of um, diagnosis and new ways of um, following these, these, um, these patients. Um, I think that could be really critical, uh, really interesting proposal right there. We could come up with something novel to take advantage of that information or that um, concept. Yeah, it's interesting because it's not unlike a little Don, Doug, and I wrote a grant on um, melanoma that we sent. And I think it was the R21, right, the, right Don? Uh, probably five years ago that was really starting to look at some, you know, comparative stuff with that tumor type, with that whole idea, um, you know, of really looking at things and it didn't get any traction at NIH at that time. So. Yeah. Maybe uh, what Don mentioned, you know, the bladder uh, mutational landscape as a uh, sort of a pathway, are there pathways that would fit better with colon cancer and how, how would you prove that or how would you take advantage of that or justify a future project uh, based on that? Yeah. There are B data kind of supports that a little bit too, in terms of, some of these multiple kind of activation sites on these various pathways. But yeah, I, I agree with that. I think the molecular characterization, you know, and, and I think the delving into some of the um, uh, immune landscape stuff and immune signatures that they've done both in, in the, in the bladder and in um, well, that was in bladder too. the stuff from the stuff that Katie did, I think, you know, might, might have some legs. Um, and so I think, you know, I think, I think the molecular stuff is critical to lots of different aspects of everything we talked about. So. All right. Well, it's a great afternoon. Thanks everybody. Um, if anybody, nobody else wants, has anything else to add again, I'll thank our speakers. I'll thank people down at the CU Cancer Center for helping us organize this. Doctors Page and Schulick um, and um, you know, the, the cancer center leadership, all the program leaders, you know, everybody that was very supportive of, of us doing this. And so, um, you know, next grants are due November 15th. Um, let's start, start thinking and start talking. So with that, pretty happy Wednesday afternoon. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, thanks. <laughs>